Aloha kaka he aka kako and hau oli la hoi hoi ea 2021. I'm glad all of you could join us this morning as we have an awesome conference that I am very excited to be able to share with everyone that, that are tuning in this morning. And uh, we have as our special guest, Dr. Keanu Sai and we have Dr. Federico Lenzarini, who's a professor from uh, from Italy. And but before we start, I would like to go over some of the actually not go over, but give you some background on Laho Iho Ea and how it came about. Because there's still a lot of people throughout Hawaii that really don't know what Laho Iho Ea is and uh, how it came about. And so let me just give you a brief history on it. Because you know, in the summer of 1842, Kamehameha III moved forward you know, to, uh, to secure the position of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a recognized independent state under international law. He sought the formal recognition of Hawaiian independence from three naval powers of the world at that time, Great Britain, France, and the United States. To accomplish this, Kamehameha III commissioned three envoys, Timoteo Haalilio and William Richardson, who at the time was still an American citizen, and Sir George Simpson, a British subject. Of all three powers, it was a British that had the legal claim over the Hawaiian Islands through sessions by Kamehameha the first. But for political reasons, the British could not openly exert, you know, its uh, claim over the two naval powers due to the island's prime economic and strategic location in the middle of the North Pacific. The political interest of all three powers was to ensure that none would have a greater interest than the other. This caused Kamehameha the third considerable embarrassment in managing his foreign relations and awakened a very strong desire that his kingdom shall be formally acknowledged by the civilized nations of the world as a sovereign independent state. So while the envoys, no, hold on my, while the envoys were on a diplomatic mission, a British naval ship, the Karras Fort, under the command of Lord Paulette, entered Honolulu Harbor on February 10, 1843, making outrageous demands on the Hawaiian government, basing his actions on complaints made to him in letters from the British consul, Richard Charlton, who was absent from the kingdom at the time. Paulette eventually seized control of the Hawaiian government on February 25, 1843 after threatening to level Honolulu with cannon fire. Kamehameha III was forced to surrender the kingdom, but did so under written protest and pending the outcome of the mission of his diplomats in Europe. News of Paulette's action reached Admiral Richard Thomas of the British Admiralty, and he sailed from the Chilean port of Valparaiso and arrived in the islands on July 25, 1843. After a meeting with Kamehameha III, Admiral Thomas determined that Charlton's complaint did not warrant a British takeover and ordered the restoration of the Hawaiian government, which took place in a grand ceremony on July 31, 1843. 
at a Thanksgiving service after the ceremony, Commandment the Third proclaimed before a large crowd, Uamau Ke'el O Ka'ainei Kapono. May the sovereignty of the land be perpetuated in righteousness. The king's statement became the national model. The envoys eventually succeeded in getting formal international recognition of the Hawaiian Islands as a sovereign independent state. Great Britain and France formally recognized Hawaiian sovereignty on November 28, 1843 by joint proclamation of the, at the Court of London and the United States followed on July 6, 1844 by a letter of Secretary of State John Calhoun. The Hawaiian Islands became the first Polynesian nation to be recognized as an independent and sovereign state. The ceremony that took place on July 31st occurred at a place we know today as Thomas Square, which honors Admiral Thomas and the roads that run along Thomas Square today of Baratania, which is a Hawaiian which is in Hawaiian for Britain and Victoria. In honor of Queen Victoria, who was the reigning British monarch at the time, the restoration of the government and recognition of, the, of Hawaiian independence took place. So both holidays, Laho Iho Iea and Laku Okoa that takes place on November 28th are very, very connected because of what happened in these places. I just wanted to do uh, to provide some historical background on uh, Laho Iho Iea because there's still a lot of people who really don't know what that uh, what that Hawaiian holiday is, and it is a very significant holiday for us as it was a restorate it was the restoration of our government. My first guest today is uh, Dr. Keanu Sai. And I'm very happy to uh, introduce Dr. Sai. And he received his doctorate in December of 2008, his PhD in political science at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. And uh, his dissertation was titled The American Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, Beginning the Transition from Occupied to Restored State. And uh, he got his master's degree in 2004, his Bachelor of Arts degree from UH Manoa in 1987, and his, his AA degree from New Mexico Military Institute in 1984. Dr. Sai is the lead agent for the Council of Regency, Acting Minister of Interior, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. That's very important today. Dr. Sai has a PhD in political science specializing in Hawaiian constitutionalism and international relations, and a founding member of the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics. He served as lead agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom in arbitration proceedings before the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague in the Netherlands from November 1999 to February 2001. He also served as agent in a complaint against the United States of America concerning the prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, which was filed with the United Nations Security Council in July of 2001. Articles on the status of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, the arbitration case, and the complaint filed with the United Nations Security Council have been published in the following journals. And, and this, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, for a lot of things that Dr. Sai has has done as well as continues to do. And most, ex most importantly, especially recently, uh, if you saw on the blog that he posted, uh, the information in regards to the Czech Republic closing their embassy and the complaint that was filed in federal court uh, in May of 2021. And it's very, very, very exciting to see uh, what is taking place. And so I'd like to introduce Dr. Keanu Sai, who will be presenting some very timely information for all of us to learn and understand. Dr. Sai, welcome. Aloha. 
Hello, thank you, Kale. Mahalo. Hello, everyone. Hello, Kako. Um, la hoi hoi ea. Restoration Day. Very important day, as Kali rightly stated, it's also directly connected to La Kuokoa, which is November 28th, when Hawaiian independence was recognized. Now, I'm going to be doing a presentation here uh, in partnership with Professor Federico Lanzarini. And my portion will be getting into an area that many people may not have uh, heard. Uh, I think we presented enough about why the overthrow in 1893 was illegal and what was overthrown was the government, not the country. Uh, why there is no treaty, therefore Hawaii was never annexed to the United States. It was unilaterally taken, okay? So putting that aside, I'm gonna be giving this presentation more from a historical narrative, right? And I'm going to leave it to uh, Professor Lanzarini to present the legalities behind some of these events, okay? So it's gonna be a, uh, a presentation that I've given before, but not widely known. I'm getting into the background behind and what started this movement of exposure and bringing that awareness to the international community about a country that has been under prolonged occupation. So why don't we begin? Uh, let me go to the share screen. Okay. And uh, let's see. So the title of my presentation today, uh, as part of La Hoi Hoi Ea, is Responding to an International Crisis. Now, as everyone knows, and this is what we've been sharing and teaching, not only at the university, but throughout the communities and throughout the world, at various universities and other places. Hawaii state sovereignty was recognized in 1843, November 28th. And it was important that it was Great Britain that recognized Hawaiian independence, not France. France just joined in, in acknowledging Great Britain's basic release of Hawaii, because prior to this, Hawaii had been a British protectorate since 1794, when King Kamehameha I uh, conveyed Hawaii to the British Empire, and King George III recognized and acknowledged Kamehameha as king, so we, was, we still maintained governance, but our allegiance was to the British crown. Very similar to what we call in our history, ali'i anna, or how chiefs govern, by always looking up to their lord above them. Now this sovereignty, state sovereignty under international law, which is the supreme authority that exists independent of other authorities over these islands was exercised by a government. And that government was a Hawaiian kingdom government. Very progressive, very progressive. Um, and it was limited. It was a constitutional monarchy. Now, as we know, that government was illegally overthrown by the United States military the U.S. Marines that were landed, and the Queen yielded her authority temporarily to the United States president because of the U.S. Marines, not because of the insurgents. But because of the U.S. Marines, she yielded her authority, but it was conditional. The condition was that she yielded her authority un until the United States does an investigation of their ambassador in Hawaii and report its findings. The second condition of that yielding of authority, which is a surrender, a conditional surrender, was that then they would restore the queen to the monarch position as head of state. And the queen was still head of state, but she was not in physical control because of the takeover. Now, President Cleveland initiated the investigation in March, 1893, by the appointment of James Blount, and that and those reports were known in our history as the Blanc reports. His final report was in July of 1893. In October, October 18th, Secretary of State Walter Gresham notifies the president of the conclusions of these reports and that we must restore the queen as the head of state and her cabinet. President Cleveland then made that investigation known to the Congress. Now between 
November 13th, 1893, and October 18th, uh, December 18th, 1893, when President Cleveland is presenting his findings to the Congress, there were negotiations going on between the Queen and the new U.S. Ambassador, Albert Willis, at the legation in Honolulu. Legation is another word for embassy. And the Queen, on the same day the President delivered his message, agreed to the conditions that she was provided to by the President, that after she is restored, that she would commit to grant amnesty to the insurgents, to these enemies of the kingdom. Well, because of political wrangling, the president was not able to restore the queen. Therefore, these insurgents remained insurgents and fugitives of Hawaiian law. They weren't American businessmen. They were enemies, enemy combatants, because now they will have a direct tie and direct nexus to the United States who overthrew that government as declared by President Cleveland by an act of war. Under international law, this hostile act is what triggered a state of war. Well, as a result of not fulfilling the second condition of the Queen's surrender, that surrender and yielding of sovereignty to the United States president was terminated. Terminated as a consequence of the failure of the United States to follow through. And that has been taking place for over a century, right? Now, the mere fact that we didn't know this doesn't mean it didn't happen, but we now understand why. So despite the government being overthrown and the temporary yielding of Hawaiian sovereignty to the United States, conditionally having been terminated, the Hawaiian state continues to exist. And that's important. What was overthrown in 1893 was the government, not the country. So the presumption of continuity of sovereignty, this is a principle of international law, okay? So Hawaii, a recognized independent state in the 19th century. So presumably Hawaii today remains a sovereign but occupied state since international law provides for the presumption of continuity of sovereignty. What that means is the presumption is not that the Hawaiian kingdom needs to prove that it still exists as a country, but rather the presumption principle uh, shifts the burden on the United States to show that you extinguish that sovereignty, meaning the burden is not on the Hawaiian kingdom, again, to prove it's still a country. The burden is upon the United States to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it is not a country, right? It's like the presumption of innocence. When somebody is prosecuted in a court of law, the defendant does not have to prove they're innocent. No, it is presumed they're innocent. It's up to the prosecutor to prove beyond a reasonable doubt providing rebuttable evidence that that person is in fact guilty, right? That's why defendants, they don't have to say anything because they are presumed innocent. Well, in our case, the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't have to say anything. It was an independent state. Therefore, it is presumed to still be an independent state unless the United States extinguished Hawaii sovereignty under international law, namely a treaty. You need a treaty in a state of war. You cannot just unilaterally seize Hawaii and claim it's yours during a state of war unless that war was justified. President Cleveland clearly said that the landing of U.S. troops was an act of war and it was not justified under the principles of international law. So normally you would have in a, justif in a justified war in the 19th century between two sovereign states. One state can actually unilaterally annex territory of another state during the war, but it can only happen during a justified war. We don't have one here, and that's important. Okay. The term that is used is a term called debalashio. That idea of debalashio, of seizure of the country, does not rise when what happened in Hawaii was completely not justified as admitted to by the president. And that's important, right? So you need a treaty, a treaty of session, or what is called a treaty of peace, to bring the state of war back to a state of peace. That hasn't occurred. No, that hasn't occurred. So today, Hawaii still remains a sovereign, but occupied state. Now, for 120 years, we had lies, lies. And as written by Donald James Will, also known as Dresden James, he's a British novelist. 
When a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. So responding to the crisis. Now, I knew this information back then, right? I knew it because I did my genealogy. My tutu requested me to know my genealogy. I shouldn't say requested. My tutu mandated me to know my genealogy because he said, when I know my genealogy, I will know what I need to do because I will know who I am. She didn't get into any details, but she was the one who started me on this path. And this was back in 1984 when I came back from New Mexico Military Institute as a commissioned officer in the Army and uh, an associate's degree in pre-business. Well, I didn't take up my tutus, kawoha, or order to me <laughs> as her oldest grandchild until 1992. Up to that point, from 1984 to 1992, I was going through a crisis myself because I'm at the University of Hawaii taking classes and learning about a history that I never was taught at Kamehameha Schools, which was a school for Aboriginal Hawaiians that was established in 1887. And then I also came to find, realize that what I was taught at the university at that time regarding the history that the missionaries controlled everything, right? The Haoles controlled everything, the Americans controlled everything. I found that is, that was to be utterly false. They controlled it after 1893, but not before. Because if the United States was in control of the Hawaiian kingdom, as we were being taught at the university, then why do you have to overthrow it? You don't overthrow it something you're already in control of. But the control came after. So how do I now know this information and how do I respond to this crisis? Given the fact that everybody in Hawaii has been denationalized, their, their, their national consciousness of a country has been obliterated, obliterated. Because I admit it was obliterated for me until I began to see the evidence in the archives because I was doing my research on genealogy, and there I knew that when you overthrow a government, you not you did not e that did not equate to the overthrow of a country. And I looked at that situation not from an academic perspective. I looked at it as a as from the position of being what is called a grunt, a military guy. Because in 1990, I was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, during the first Gulf War when Iraq invaded Kuwait, and we knew in gathering in receiving intel, live intel coming in, because I was at officer's advance course as a captain being trained to do battle planning. As we're getting this live intel, we knew that even though Saddam Hussein overthrew the Kuwaiti government, that did not mean Kuwait ceased to exist, even when Saddam Hussein said and proclaimed unilaterally that Kuwait was now the 19th province of Iraq. No, Iraqi law is limited to US territory. Kuwait was still Kuwait. And the job of the military at that time was to expel the Iraqis out of Kuwait so that the Kuwaiti government can come out of exile in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, back to Kuwait City. So I knew that you can overthrow a government without overthrowing a country strictly from military experience. And that is what started me to look into this with a very different set of eyes. And that's when I began to realize we have a crisis over 100 years, over a century of occupation. It's like over a century of Saddam Hussein controlling Kuwait and Kuwaitis have been led to believe they're Iraqis and, they're, and, and, and that's all they know. So their national consciousness was replaced. That's exactly what happened here. So how do I respond to this crisis? When I'm looking around everywhere, even my own family, clueless. Well, I only could rely on something that I knew, and that was my military service and my training as an officer in battle planning. The one thing we learned as officers in Army, actually during officer's basic course that I attended in 1987 in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, as a second lieutenant, uh, one of the required readings was not only platoon leader, <laughs> but San Su, the art of war. And what we got out of the art of, art of war as officers was that you must know your adversary like the back of your hand, not necessarily to defeat, but to anticipate the moves. Because if you can anticipate the moves, you're still in the game. If you don't anticipate the moves, you get removed from the game. You get taken out. 
So it's important that in order to know your adversary, you have to have reliable intel. You have to know how this adversary or this op four uh, won. Understand how they fight. Look at also when they lost, understand how they lost and what did the other side do? So all this comes into play in looking at something through what is called Intel. Now I served in the Hawaii Army National Guard, both active and reserve, between 1984 and 1994 for 10 years. I attended Field Artillery Officers Basic Course in 1987 and Officers Advanced Course in 1990 at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I also attended Air Ground Operations School in 1990 at Herbert Field, Florida, and battlefield exercises in Japan, Korea, and Fort Lewis, Washington. As officers, what was instilled in us was military professionalism, honesty and integrity, because lies erode credibility and undermine confidence. Straightforwardness, add frankness to honesty and integrity. Candor is the forthright of offering of unrequested information when something is known to be wrong. Confidence, because no task is daunting and ultimately respect for the rule of law. Okay, these were the tenets of being an officer, at least the way I was trained, okay? This would all come into play in preparing me to about to engage this international crisis. Now in 1880, there was a statute enacted by the Hawaiian legislature regarding ali'i genealogies or genealogies of nobility. So the act was titled to perpetuate the genealogy of the chiefs of Hawaii. Whereas it is provided by the 22nd article of the constitution that the kings of Hawaii shall be chosen from the native chiefs of the kingdom. And whereas at the present day in 1880, it is difficult to ascertain who are the chiefs as contemplated by said article of the constitution. And it is proper that such genealogies of the kingdom be perpetuated. And also the history of the chiefs and kings from ancient times down to the present day, which would also be a guide to the king in the appointment of nobles in the legislative assembly. Therefore, being enacted by the king in the legislative assembly of the Hawaiian Islands, in the legislature of the kingdom assembled, and that's when this uh, law was passed. Okay. Why am I bringing this law? Because it's something that I tapped into without even knowing it. In fact, when I when I went to the archives in 1992, I asked the archivist there, can you help me? Uh, how do I begin to look up my genealogy? Because my tutu had requested I know it as the oldest mo'opuna, the oldest grandchild back in 1984. She has since passed. And this archivist said, well, why don't you go to this book and take a look? And this book, this, there are two books written, uh, collected or edited by uh, Edith McKenzie and Ishmael Stender from BYU, Laie. And it was a collection of, of genealogies that were published in newspapers. So I went ahead, I went to the index, and I looked up my, my tutu's maiden name, Simerson, which is very uncommon, right? So I looked it up, Simerson, and it was there. And it pointed me to a particular page number. I'm like, really? <laughs> went to the page number, and lo and behold, that's when I found the genealogy of not only my mom's side of the family, which is my maternal tutu that I was speaking about, but also my dad's side of the family. So these newspapers that were in this uh, book were reprinted from what was published in 1896 in the Kamakainana newspaper. And it was called Mo'oku Au Hawali'i, chiefly genealogy. Well, here I found that I was a direct descendant of Pohayali'i Koi'i, Hawaiian chief is from my father's side. And I was also a direct descendant of Lua Pana Simerson, Hawaiian chief is from my mother. And this was the Kamakainana newspaper. Throughout the year of 1896, they were publishing all the genealogies. This is the board of genealogists putting this on record because they could not publish it in book form because the government was overthrown in 1893. So this is the Mo'oku Hawali'i for Lucy Pohayali'i Koi'i, and for Miss Luapana Simerson. 
Well, my great grandfather, this is my tutu's dad, okay, is William Kuakini Simerson. And here's a picture of him. He was a direct descendant of kings of Hawaii, Liloa, Umia Liloa, Alapa Inui, and Keawe II. Keawe II was a predecessor to Colonial Pu'u. He was a high chief and served as one of the pallbearers for Queen Lili Ukalani in 1917. And that's where he is there. And you see that circle. But he also served as a pallbearer, one of 14 pallbearers for Prince Kuhio in 1922. And that's where, and that's that's him right there. As I'm looking up this information, I cannot explain how, how overwhelming this was in me knowing that I'm a descendant directly of these people, that I had no clue who they were before, none. My third great-grandmother on my dad's side is Pohayali Koi'i. Koi'i. Genealogy chanter for King Kalakaua and Queen Liliuokalani's court. Accompanied the queen. She accompanied the queen when the queen adjourned the 1892 legislature when everything blew up. And she would also visit Prince Kuhio at his Waikiki home with my paternal grandfather, my papa. So with this background of who I am that I've uncovered, or should I say I've, I've reawakened to this, I had Kuleana. I also had the training as an officer. And I thought, okay, we can move ahead. We're going to address this head on. I'm going to rely on my military training to do that. So when we look at the governmental infrastructure that existed in the Hawaiian kingdom, you already had three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. And it was called the Hawaiian kingdom. The only thing that happened in 1893 was a change in name. They replaced the queen and her cabinet. Everyone else stayed in place and they were forced to sign oaths of allegiance to the provisional government. That, uh, forcing our people to sign the oath of allegiance to the insurgents, right, was a regime change. It wasn't a complete overthrow. It was a hijacking, and that's important, especially when I'm about to look at how we're going to engage this situation. And then in 1894, the provisional government merely changed their name to the Republic. Same institution, same governmental infrastructure. And then in 1900, the governmental infrastructure again will be changed by name to the territory of Hawaii. And then in 1959, the state of Hawaii. So what I'm looking at here through Intel is that the only change that happened to the Hawaiian Kingdom government was a hijacking. That's important to know. It's not, okay, we need to create a whole new government because this government here is not ours. No, in fact, it is. It's just that we're not in control. Well, then all you have to do is return it back to the Hawaiian Kingdom, right? That, that's, that's the logic. That's, that's how things are supposed to be, right? Okay. So how do we go about doing that? So we know that what was overthrown in, the, in 1893 was the government, the monarch, the constitutional monarch, not the country. The legal system still exists. And that according to the laws of occupation, the United States should have administered the laws of the occupied state. If they did, we wouldn't be in our position that we are in now. Instead, they hid it. Lies, a web of lies was created. Nevertheless, the law still remains. So, Council of Regency. A regency, under, by definition, serves in the absence of a monarch. It is not a monarch. And we're going to look at what happened with Belgium in 1940, when World War II began. And Belgium was invaded by Nazi Germany. The Nazis captured King Leopold. Belgian nationals fled. Belgium because of the occupation and they formed the government in exile. What they formed was a council of regency and the council of regency was provided for in their constitution where ministers of the government shall become a council of regency that serves in the absence of a monarch until they can convene the legislature. Well, Obviously, these officers could not convene the legislature from London, which is where they were because they fled Belgium. But the Constitution says they shall be a council of regency, the ministers. So they could wait for the legislative assembly to be reconvened 
to elect by ballot when the occupation comes to an end. So if it worked for the Belgians, then why not it work for the Hawaiians? Under Article 33, it says, should a sovereign decease, this is Queen Lili Okalani, and having made no last will and testament, the cabinet council at the time of such decease shall be a council of regency until the legislative assembly may be assembled. And the legislative assembly immediately that is assembled shall pr proceed to choose by ballot a regent or council of regency who shall administer the government in the name of the king and exercise all the powers which are constitutionally vested in the king. Again, our statute is very, our constitutional provision is very similar to Belgium's provision where the cabinet council shall be a council of regency until, so that's important. And we're going to zero in on this council of regency by accessing one of the minister's offices in the cabinet council. Now, Article 42 says the king's cabinet shall consist of the minister of foreign affairs, the minister of the interior, the minister of finance, and the attorney general of the kingdom. Because Hawaii was a constitutional monarchy, these offices and these laws still exist. It's just there is no physical body filling these vacancies, but they exist. In the army, we call it a chain of command. Now, we're going to assume the chain of command to one of the officers of the cabinet, okay, under what is called the doctrine of necessity. And this is something that we would use a lot in the army when a private can become a lieutenant in time of war if everyone in the chain of command was killed. It is that private's duty to assume the chain of command in order to maintain the command structure. This doctrine of necessity also applies to private citizens or nationals of a country in assuming the role of government that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do, especially if these positions of government are positions uh, filled by people who were commissioned by an authority, in this case, our monarch, the queen, in designating ministers. Well, there's also a way to get to that point without a commission, and that would be under the doctrine of necessity. So this legal doctrine states as one of the elements, an imperative necessity must arise of the existence of exceptional circumstances not provided for in the constitution for immediate action to be taken to protect or preserve some vital function of the state. Now, these elements of necessity was actually described and used in a British case, a British court case, where a person was accused of treason when he assumed the role of being governor general in one of the former British colonies. There must be no other course of action reasonably available. Actions taken must be reasonably necessary in the interests of peace, order, and good government. It must not impair the just rights of citizens under the Constitution, even in our case, when our people don't even know their rights. It still cannot impair those rights. And finally, it must not have the intention of consolidating power, because if it has the intention of consolidating power, then that goes along the lines of a coup d'etat. No, no. We are sticking within the umbrella, under the umbrella of necessity, and we've got to be very careful. So <clears throat> we're going to take a look at how we're going to access, how we're going to access one of the officers in that cabinet. And that cabinet officer is going to be the Minister of the Interior. We're going to take a look at the 1880 Co-Partnership Statute. It says here, whenever any two or more persons shall carry on business in this kingdom in co-partnership, it shall be incumbent for such persons to file in the office of the Minister of the Interior their co-partnership agreements. Well, one of the offices of the Minister of the Interior is the Bureau of Conveyances. Now, the Bureau of Conveyances still exists today. Remember, the institutions continued just a name change. So the Bureau of Conveyances today is under the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. The original name of what is called the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs is the Ministry of the Interior. So how are we going to utilize this statute to assume the chain of command? Okay, we're going to create a co-partnership firm, which has to be recorded in the bureau, in the registrar with the registrar of the Bureau of Conveyances. And that registrar reports 
under Hawaiian law to the Minister of the Interior. So in the absence of the registrar today, the lawful registrar, and in absence of the Minister of the Interior, this co-partnership can assume that role. And that's how we're going to package it. On December 10th, 1995, the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company was established to restore the Hawaiian Kingdom government under the doctrine of necessity. Here's the deed of general partnership. The company will serve in the capacity of acting for and on behalf of the Hawaiian Kingdom government, here and after referred to as the absentee government. The company has adopted the Hawaiian Constitution of 1864 and the laws lawfully established in the administration of the same. Now, in the kingdom, since 1880, co-partnership papers, uh, agreements, were all registered in the Bureau of Conveyances. So all we merely did was take a few of those partnership agreements that were already registered in the Bureau of Conveyances, and that pretty much was a template on how we would form our partnership today, well, not today, back then in 1995. So here is myself and Donald Lewis, the two partners of the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company. We knew that the trust company cannot continue to represent the Hawaiian government in the absence of a monarch because it was a partnership. It was merely a means to get to a particular point. It's like a canoe that's going to get us across the river. So Don and I had a meeting and it was decided that one of us will step out of the partnership, okay, because of a conflict of interest, step out of the partnership and be prepared to receive in an appointment by the partners of the company to be a regent pursuant to Article 33 of the Hawaiian Constitution. Now, in order to do that, we have to keep in mind, we have to stay under the partnership statute of 1880. So if I'm going to convey my one half undivided interest to Don, I have to be careful that we do not allow this partnership to lapse into what is called sole proprietorship because sole proprietorship was not regulated under Hawaiian law. You don't have to record it. We need to stay within the partnership statute. So what would happen is we came to an agreement where I will convey my interests on a particular day, but it would not take effect until the following day. And that's important because that would allow Don who received full uh, interest in the company to reassign by deed a 1% interest to his daughter, Naya Ulumai Malu. And then both of these deeds, mine and Naya, I mean, uh, Don's, would take effect the following day on February 28th. This would all take place on February 27th, right? It's also called a simultaneous transaction. Once we did this, we were able to maintain the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company under the co-partnership statute, and that was our intent. Then, Naya Ulumai Malu and Don Lewis, as trustees of the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company, could now appoint myself as acting regent on March 1st, 1996, in order to replace the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company. And then the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company would then be dissolved, okay? It would be dissolved later on in June of that same year. And it was recorded in the Bureau of Conveyances. So here I am now, formerly a part of these private entities, uh, this private entity called the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company. I am now in my private capacity accepting an appointment to a public position as acting regent. It was then my job to fulfill or fill the vacancies of the other cabinet ministers, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Finance, and the Attorney General. On September 7, 1999, I appointed Umiali Luasai as minister, acting Minister of Foreign Affairs. Also on that same day, I appointed Ms. Kaui uh, Goodhue, also known today as Kaui Sai Dudua, as mi acting Minister of Finance. And then I also appointed Gary Dubin as acting Attorney General thus filling the cabinet and establishing the council of regency. And then from that point on, I resumed the position of minister of the interior amongst the, with the other officers. And then I also then was appointed by the other officers as the chairman of the council of regency. 
Now, in 2013, Gary Dubin submits his letter of resignation. And the next month, Dexter Kayama is appointed as the Attorney General. And he currently is the Acting Attorney General to date. So what we've done is we have Hawaiian state sovereignty, still in effect, and now a regency, a restored government since 1997 that can now speak on behalf of a country that has been silent for over a century. The purpose of the acting government as officers de facto is to expose the prolonged and illegal occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom by the United States, expose. It is not trying to get control. No, no, we're not in control because we're occupied and the law of occupation mandates that the occupier must administer the laws of the occupied state as a occupying government, right? So we are not trying to get control of the country. No, we are occupied. It is the United States through the state of Hawaii that is obligated to follow the law of occupation. And it was our job to expose that. Also to ensure that the United States complies with the laws of occupation, which includes the Hague and Geneva Conventions. And also to provide for an effective transition of the lawful government in accordance with international law when the occupation eventually comes to an end. Well, we have a strategic plan that we develop in three phases. Phase one, verification of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. Once we get an international body today to verify that the Hawaiian kingdom still exists, we then move to phase two, exposure. Exposure of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. And then that will naturally trigger phase three, restoration of the DUR government or lawful government, okay, when the occupation ultimately comes to an end. So this is how the Council of Regency is going to approach this crisis. Part of that exposure, we're not going to wait till an entity at the international level verifies our existence. We are operating on the presumption that it exists. We don't have to prove it. We're going to just expose it. Okay. So before the verification phase was fulfilled, we had established Perfect Title Company. And this is the story of Perfect Title Company, which has been the subject of a lot of lies and a lot of innuendos. I can guarantee you it's all false. Well, we knew that we need to address something within the country today that has a direct link to 1893. But what can you expose or work on that would that would get people to see this right what we wanted to do is focus on land because everyone is going to feel that pinch because what we're going to show is that all titles stopped in 1893 but we have to do it in a way that is professional do it in a way that is understandable in today's world right but this is what we're going to expose so all titles today in hawaii go back to royal patents which were issued after 1845. When a person receives a royal patent, okay, the Bureau of Convenances was already established in 1845. You have to get it notarized in order to transfer title that you received under a royal patent or a land commission award. And section 1262 of the uh, civil code says, all deeds, leases for a term of more than one year or other conveyances of real estate within this kingdom shall be recorded in the office of the Registrar of Conveyances. That still exists today. It hasn't changed because it has. it is a repository of all deeds from the kingdom since 1845 till today. Now, before you can file it in the Bureau of Conveyances, you have to get it notarized. Well, section 1267 says, no person who is not a subject of this kingdom shall be eligible to the office of notary public. Hmm. That's going to be interesting because we're going to find a defect. Row patents could not be granted by the provisional government because it was self-declared, right? They're enemies. They're insurgents. Deeds of conveyances of real property and mortgages after January 17th cannot be considered lawful because the registrar of conveyances and the notaries were insurgents and members of the so-called provisional government and its successor, the Republic of Hawaii. The president admitted these are insurgents and asked the queen, would you grant amnesty to these people after you're restored? You wouldn't ask the queen to grant amnesty 
to innocent people. Well, the fact that the president didn't carry out that agreement to restore the queen, well, these individuals are still enemies and insurgents as acknowledged by the president of the United States in his investigation. So they became fugitives of Hawaiian law. Okay, well, that's one thing. The point here though is they're not notaries. They're not a registrar. In fact, Thomas Thrum was the registrar of conveyances. He's a traitor, right? He was Hawaiian, Hawaiian subject, but he's a traitor. Anton Rosa, a notary, he became a traitor. The point is these were insurgents. So if they were members in 1893 of the provisional government, you will see their names as a notary. Hawaiian, real Hawaiian notaries could not notarize because they had to have first taken the oath of allegiance to the insurgents. Well, even those who took the allegiance, they notarized. Problem is, they're still insurgents. That creates a problem called a defect in title. They were not officers of the Hawaiian kingdom. So what you have in the record in the bureau is fraud. This is in 1893, okay? This is the first royal patent issued by the so-called provisional government. Take a look at what you have there. This template says, Lili Ukalani, by the grace of God, queen. It's crossed out and handwritten in Sanford B. Doe, president of the provisional government. And this was given to Cornwell. It's interesting about Cornwell. Cornwell was one of the ministers of Queen Lili Ukalani's cabinet. This is evidence he turned traitor. Well, here is a traitor gaining a patent from the provisional government, pretending to be a government, which are also made up of traitors. He didn't get anything. Now, the second page of this, uh, of this uh, royal patent, they they even cross out Lili Ukalani, Lili Ukalani's name. And Sanford B. Dole signs it, president of the provisional government. And at the bottom left, it says, by the queen, crossed out by the president. James A. King signed it. He's a traitor. That means this title here is in Holuoloa. Now, Holuoloa, North Kona. And this is uh, comprised of 38 acres today. That means somebody, people today in Holuoloa, their title derives from this fraud. So what we have is a chain of title that we're going to rely on when we address this through what we will call perfect title company. So all titles originated since 1845 by royal patents okay, or land commission awards. In this case, in 1854, a royal patent was issued to a person. That person then conveyed either a portion of the land that he received or the entirety of that land that he received from the government in 1874, which means he needs a notary to validate the deed and then record it. And then in 1884, that person conveyed it to another person who conveyed it to another person in 1894, to another person in 1897, to someone in 1975, where somebody today currently owns it, right? The problem here is, and what we're going to set up to expose, because we can control the records from the Bureau, but we cannot control the politics outside. Well, there's a break in the chain of title, an incompetent notary. There's no treaty, okay? No treaty of session. And that treaty, because there was no treaty, that, mean, that means Hawaii was not part of the United States, okay? So if there was no treaty, then who was the notary in 1975? That was a state of Hawaii notary. Might have been my auntie, might have been my cousin, right? But the problem is, they still weren't a valid notary. So the fact that there's no treaty, it took out the ability for a state of Hawaii, state of Hawaii notary to acknowledge anything. Okay. Now, also in 1893, you have the Cleveland Lili Oakland Agreement of Restoration, where the president acknowledges these are insurgents and asks the queen to grant amnesty after being restored. Obviously, that didn't take place. She wasn't restored, therefore, they're still insurgents. So this conveyance that occurred in 1894 and 1897 have been nullified because insurgents cannot at the same time be a valid notary. So how are we going to expose this? Well, we're going to be using terms today to help people understand this. 
The term mortgage, it is defined as collateral assigned to a lender that it secures the repayment of a promissory note. So when you hear people say, I pay a mortgage, no, you don't. You pay a loan secured by a mortgage. So mortgage is what you provide as collateral to the lender in order for the lender to hold on to, to ensure the repayment of the loan. When you pay off the loan, he releases the mortgage back to you as an asset and you, go, you can borrow again. Now the loan in real estate terms is called a promissory note. And that is a loan taken out from the lender. Uh, before the lender okay, uh, uh, accepts the mortgage, he has to make sure he got good title because if you have good title and you pay off the loan, then the bank can release the mortgage, right? The releasing of that mortgage back to the person who mortgaged the property in the first place. That's, that's based upon whether or not that person has title. And that's why we get into what is called a title report. A title report done in escrow, okay? A title report done in escrow. And uh, um, the bank will not loan the money until a report, until the report is uh, uh, done by a title company to verify that the let, that the borrower has good title to give to the bank as a mortgage to hold on as collateral to ensure the repayment of the loan. But what the bank requires, not just the title report to show that the person actually owns it, but that the borrower has to purchase title insurance in the amount of the money borrowed to protect the lender. So just in case the title report was defective. Yeah, let's say that uh, I use the island of Koolave as collateral to borrow $300,000. And the bank says, you own Koholave? I say, yeah, I own Koholave. The island has been in my family for years. Well, they re require me to go to a title company to do a title report to make sure that my family actually owns that property. Therefore, I can use it as collateral. They do a title report. They say, yeah, Keanu's family owns it. Keanu is, uh, is authorized to use it as, a, as collateral, as a mortgage. And then later down the road, another title report comes up showing that I really didn't own it. It was all fraud. Well, the bank cannot foreclose on me because I don't have a mortgage because it's void. But what I do have is an outstanding loan owed to the bank. That's where title insurance covers and protects the bank in case there's a defect in the title that was not picked up by the escrow company. So that's how it works, right? So in order to engage this and expose it, we're going to show how it works and how people are tied to this. So here you have the bank, issues a promissory note to the borrower. The borrower goes to escrow, buys title insurance, and then provides a mortgage to the bank that he holds on to. Later on, the borrower finds out that there's a defect in title that negates the mortgage. There's no collateral. Well, the borrower now must notify the title insurance company that there's a defect in title, right? But also the bank has to notify the insurance company of the defect, but the borrower has to provide that information to the bank because you have two types of insurance, owner's policy where the borrower provides the evidence and the lender's policy where the bank provides the evidence. But the borrower is the one who found the evidence. So the borrower has to notify the bank. And if it notifies the bank, then the bank pays off the loan, the balance that is owed, and the borrower is good. He fulfilled his contract of what he owed to the lender where he covered it with insurance. Now that puts a lot of pressure on the title insurance industry. This is where we're going to focus our attention. So we created in December on December 10th, 1995, Perfect Title Company. The above mentioned parties have agreed to form a general partnership on the firm name, under the firm name of Perfect Title Company in the process of researching, manufacturing, and selling of land title reports. This is to provide the evidence for people to provide uh, to the insurance company to initiate the claim as to why there is a defect in the notary of 1893. Well, because clients were actually buying title reports, and these title reports cost $1,500, $1,500 to do a title report over 150 years. Now you take title guarantee at that very same time in 1996, they would do a title report 
for 150 years, but it would cost $17,000. That was the rate. Perfect title was $1,500. $1,500. So it, we made the front page of the Honolulu Advertiser. Title firm disdains land claims made since end of monarchy. Now remember, when we're coming out with information and speaking straight about the Hawaiian kingdom's con continued existence and why Hawaiian law still exists, we're being viewed as lunatics. Remember that British novelist? Yeah, we're going to be viewed as lunatics when in fact we're talking the truth. So it says here in this article, perfect title considers any certificate transferred after the 1893 overthrow of Queen Lili Okalani to be invalid because it passed through individuals or institutions treasonous to the crown. Now today, that makes perfect sense because people are educated. Back in 1996, that's crazy talk. That's Looney Tunes, <laughs> but it's true. That was as a result of uh, denationalization throughout the islands. Nobody could understand that. We knew that, but we're gonna stick to the records. And that started a firestorm, newspaper articles, Title disputes bring trouble to Iowa homes. Courts should punish land title scam artists. <laughs> State must do more to stabilize titles. Perfect title, focus of criminal pro. This was all driven by the title, in, the title insurance industry. Headed by an attorney named John Jubinski representing uh, Chicago, uh, uh, Title Guarantee of Hawaii who then was getting the state of Hawaii to do something. Yeah, that's where it was all coming from. It says perfect title has created chaos in Hawaii's real estate industry with its claims that current land titles are no good. The company reaches those conclusions using 19th century Hawaiian kingdom law, which it says is still in effect and by doing and by searching property records dating to the 1840s. This here created such a firestorm amongst the realtors in Hawaii, real estate agents and brokers, because they have a responsibility to disclose to potential clients that there might be a problem with the title. So when they were trying to get information from the title companies, the title companies were not refuting this information. They were creating ideas and false narratives that, that perfect title telling elderly people don't pay their mortgage, right? It's going on the news. Uh, uh, Joe Moore is calling me a charlatan. Uh, Barbara Marshall from Action Line, when she interviewed me, she asked me, are you telling people not to pay their mortgages? I corrected her. You don't pay a mortgage, you pay a loan secured by a mortgage. And I said, they got title insurance. That's what pays off the loan. That is how they fulfill their debt owed to the lender. Well, she went on the news on Channel 2 News and said, uh, perfect, title, perfect title is telling elderly people don't pay their mortgages. Again, the firestorm. So here you have collusion between the title industry, landowners, and the state of Hawaii. What got the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this organization of realtors, the Hawaii Developers Council, okay, to put on a workshop at the Hawaii Prince Hotel in 1997. And over 500 people showed up. And I'm going to be sitting on this panel with, title, with president of Title Guarantee Escrow, David Peach, Bruce Graham from Ashford and Riston Law Firm, who also teaches land titles at UH Law School. Neil Holbert, an attorney from Austin and Hunt representing Chicago Title Insurance Company. Myself and Donald Lewis, and an attorney from Bank of Hawaii to be the moderator. We had a slide projector. We showed all the evidence. You could hear a pin drop. They, realized they didn't know how real this was. Well, they all left the presentation in awe. Now, Bruce Graham came up to me after that workshop. And he comes up to me and says, you know, Keanu, uh, we have to talk. I said, okay, Bruce, what, what, what's up? And I didn't know him. I just met him that day. He says, uh, what, uh, people are going to get hurt. You, gotta, you folks go down this road. I said, Bruce, we're a title company. We do title reports. Title reports to provide evidence for claims to be filed with insurance companies. That's all it is. And I said, I sent you one of our title reports, my own family's property in Kuli'o'o, which is derived from the territorial government under a land patent, the old homestead program. I provided that uh, report to you. All you need to do is to go line by line and refute it. 
Because if you can refute it, get us on fraud. And he tells me, I have it and I can't refute it. It is historically and factually correct. So then I said, so what's the problem? He said, well, America's here and that's just the way it is. I said, really? I didn't know America's involved with title insurance because that's what it really is. But that's when I knew perfect title, title reports are solid. They're accurate. And I got it straight from the professor that teaches land titles at UH Law School. Well, two weeks later, our offices get raided by the Honolulu Police Department White Collar Crime Unit. We can't falsify them, smear them. That's what started the smear campaign because they can't refute the title reports. And that is when our offices were raided. As stated by the Star Bulletin, as part of a state criminal investigation, Honolulu police yesterday morning arrested Donald Lewis, David Kianusai, and a company secretary for investigation of theft, racketeering, and tax evasion. And this was part of that machine of propaganda. Yeah. Then they couldn't find anything on theft, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, racketeering yeah, and theft, right? So they get us on, well, you attempted to steal a house in IA by doing a title report, which belonged, the property belonged to one of Perfect, Perfect Title's clients. Now, who is the complainant in this manufactured attack? An attorney? from Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. He was the complainant who had purchased the property in foreclosure after the fact. And he was claiming that we attempted to steal his house. Well, you can't steal a house that doesn't move, right? But again, feeding into this. Now this has nothing to do with fraud, right? Like everybody says we were, we were convicted of. This is about attempted theft of land, a class B felony. Well, the article states perfect title company executives, Donald Lewis and David Keanu Sai and two other people indicted on theft charges this week can expect to be arrested within days if they don't turn themselves in, the attorney general's office said today. Well, according to the criminal law written by Cook and Marcus, the subject of theft is personal property, not real estate. The same thing with the model penal code. It's not real estate. But the, but the money's derived from the real estate. What connection does Perfect Title have with the attorney from the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs who was claimed to be a victim, manufactured? But everybody wants to hear this because they want, they want to believe that Perfect Title is wrong. So if you can't falsify or refute the title reports, attack them and attack their uh, reputation. And that's what you had. And then the jury convicts and it says here, the verdict culminates the state's investigation into the now defunct company, which stirred widespread anxiety in real estate industry when it challenged property titles based on the laws of the Hawaiian kingdom before the 1893 overthrow of Queen Lili Okalani. What's amazing is I still stood firm throughout these proceedings. It must, it's directly tied to my military training, you know, dealing with adversity. But I started to see how this affects my family. So I took my ring off when I first got arrested. Nobody's going to know who my family is. I was married. I had two young boys. You're not going to know them. Because if you're going to do this to me, I don't know what you're going to do to my family. A lot of people thought I was this lone wolf. wolf. No, no, these are decisions you have to make. Now, what's interesting is when it came to the sentencing on March 7, 2000, Judge Sandra Sims comes out and the courtroom is packed with people. I didn't call them there. They just came. She stands up and she says, Mr. Sai, I want to apologize to you for what you're going through. <laughs> I was taken aback. She's apologizing to a so-called convicted felon. She says that this court, nor the state of Hawaii, will prevent you from traveling to The Hague in the Netherlands at the Permanent Court of Arbitration because that proceeding was initiated back in November of 1999, and I am the head of state representing the Council of Regency. So she said, I have to sentence you. Now the, the Attorney General is asking for five years in prison. I have to sentence you to, I want to sentence you to probation so that you will be allowed to travel. 
And you know what? This whole thing was manufactured. But, you know, staying focused on what I got to do. My job is to expose and draw attention to the country, not upon me. And that's something that I learned in the Army, you know. So it's starting to work in my favor, right? And then the Larson case initiates where we have oral hearings held in December of 2000. Now, the case was initiated, though, on November 8, 1999. And this is the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Okay? And that's me at the top left. That's our Attorney General at the time, Gary Dubin, bottom left. Uh, bottom right, Professor Crawford, who later became a judge on the International Court of Justice, who recently passed away. And at the top right, Gavin Griffith, former uh, Solicitor General from Australia. They were arbitrators, along with Professor Christopher Greenwood, who also became a judge on the International Court of Justice. Now, the American Journal of International Law, after the decision was made, came out and they, they cover court cases, international court cases. And they write, at the center of the PCA proceedings was that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist and that the Hawaiian Council of Regency representing the Hawaiian Kingdom is legally responsible under international law for the protection of Hawaiian subjects, including the claimant. In other words, says the American Journal, the Hawaiian Kingdom was legally obligated to protect Larson from the United States unlawful imposition over him of its municipal laws through its political subdivision, the state of Hawaii. As a result of this responsibility, Larson submitted that the Council of Regency should be liable for any international law violations that the United States had committed against him. So, what is the Permanent Court of Arbitration? Well, it's what is called an intergovernmental organization that was formed by countries, which include the United States, that signed a treaty okay, in 1899 and 1907. And this intergovernmental organization called the Permanent Court of Arbitration, they create ad hoc tribunals with regard to specific disputes that come before them for dispute resolution under international law. Now, the PCA has what is called institutional jurisdiction for the following disputes meaning there is a provision in the treaty that formed the court that the permanent court of arbitration is not only open for those countries that are contracting states, but also allows non-contracting states to enter. And these are countries that did not sign the treaty. And that, that allowance of non-contracting states to enter the court is according to Article 47 of the 1907 Convention. So the PCA has institutional jurisdiction for the following disputes. And one of the parties has to be a state where they're contracting or non-contracting. So they can hear a dispute between two states, in this case, from the case repository of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. This is a case, Ecuador versus the United States. And this was a dispute regarding the application of Article 2 of the treaty between the US and Ecuador. They first needed to verify the standing of the parties before they can create the tribunal. They verified that Ecuador was a state at the time and the United States was a state. Okay. Then they can hear disputes between a state and an international organization, in this case, Peru versus the United Nations Office for Project Services. Here they identify uh, Peru as a state and the United Nations as an international organization. And then they can also hear a dispute by forming a tribunal where a state and a private party is involved. In this case, this is the Hawaiian Kingdom. And this is a case repository where they identify the Hawaiian Kingdom as private entity, uh, sorry, Lars Larson as a private entity and the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state. And here in the case description, it says, Lance Paul Larson, a resident of Hawaii, brought a claim against the Hawaiian government by its counselor regency on the grounds that the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, which is the Regency, is in violation of these treaties for allowing the unlawful imposition of American law over Mr. Larson within the territorial jurisdiction of the Hawaiian Kingdom. This dispute here was not about whether or not the kingdom exists. This dispute was whether or not Lance Larson can hold to account the Council of Regency as the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom for allowing American laws. That is what we call subject matter jurisdiction. What the Permanent Court of Arbitration had to do when the case was initiated in November of 1999 was to verify that the Hawaiian Kingdom was still an independent state. 
under Article 47 of the 1907 Hague Convention, and they did. The tribunal was not formed until June of 2000, okay? And that's important. A lot of people misunderstand these proceedings. Remember, we're the defendant in this case. But in order to get the case heard, before the permanent court of arbitration, which could create the tribunal, they had to verify whether or not Hawaii is an independent state pursuant to Article 47 that allows non-contracting states to access the facility. So here they identify, in June, they formed a tribunal made up of Gavin Griffith, Professor Greenwood, and Professor Crawford. Ms. Ninia Parks represented the, uh, Lance Larson, and I served as lead agent of the legal team representing the Hawaiian Kingdom. So I'm very familiar with these proceedings. Now, the Permanent Court of Arbitration verified the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state and a subject of international law. For the Hawaiian Kingdom, that's called phase one, complete. We got it. Permanent Court of Arbitration also recognized the Council of Regency as the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And phase two was initiated. Begin exposure of Hawaiian statehood within the framework of international law and the laws of occupation. After the last day of the hearing in the Netherlands, our Minister of, uh, of Foreign Affairs, Umi Ali Loasai, was contacted by Dr. Bio Zagara, okay, who's a uh, ambassador from Rwanda. He was at the court on that fri uh, on Friday, the previous Friday, attending a hearing at the International Court of Justice, and he was made aware of these proceedings at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and he was able to access the records because we made the records public right? It was in private. So we got the call from him and he asked if we could meet, the Council Regency could meet with him um, in Brussels, Belgium. So the next day, December 12th, we traveled by train to Brussels and we're in a meeting with this ambassador. And he conveys to us that his government has been reviewing all the pleadings and records of the case. Okay? His government in Kigali, and it is clear, he tells us, always occupied. And this cannot be tolerated for over a century. And then he basically offers to the Council of Regency that Rwanda is prepared to report to the United Nations General Assembly the prolonged occupation of Hawaii by putting it on the agenda. Well, that was a big move or a big offer being made. So I excused myself from the ambassador. I said, I need to speak to my legal team on the side. So we sat down and we spoke, okay? And we decided it's premature. Our people back home have no idea of Hawaii's status, and we cannot allow Rwanda to hold up Hawaii when our own people can't even stand. We knew we had to address denationalization. So I sat back down in front of the ambassador. I said, uh, please convey our sincere gratitude to your president, but we cannot accept this offer at this time. We have to go home and begin re-education and address over a, a century of brainwashing, okay, called denationalization through Americanization. And that is where our focus came. So he thanked me, I thanked him, gave our salutations, we headed back to The Hague, okay, and he headed back to the embassy. So in this uh, uh, meeting of the Council of Regency, we have to look at what are the rules that we have to operate within. And this comes out of Field Manual 27-10, the law of land warfare. It says remedies for violations of international law, war crimes. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. This is what we're going to do. Publication of the facts with a view to influencing public opinion against the offending belligerent. We made the decision that since I already had a bachelor's degree, 1987 in sociology, but I know what they're teaching and it's wrong. I'm going to engage that disinformation and misinformation by entering the political science department as a graduate student to get my master's degree in political science, specializing in international relations, and then my PhD, focusing on the Hawaiian kingdom, its existence and its current occupation. While there, we formed the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics okay, at UH Manoa. HSLP was a student organization that applies public international laws between states and applicable theories to Hawaiian history. HSLP's purpose 
was to promote the development of curriculum on the subject of Hawaiian statehood under international law for UH Manoa. Professor Kanalu Young, who served as faculty advisor to the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics, who passed in 2008, but he wrote in his article, my work advocates a context-based approach for the development of a body of publishable research that gives life and structure to Hawaiian national consciousness and connects thereby to the theory of state continuity. And this unleashed a plethora of academic research, articles, peer review, law review, master's theses, doctoral dissertations, books. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, this research since then had a major impact, and that's important, a major impact. In fact, it got Tom Kaufman, who wrote uh, a book in 1998 about the American annexation of Hawaii, changing his, changed his subtitle, which is now published by Duke University, to the American occupation of Hawaii, not the annexation of Hawaii. Well, it also had an impact on teachers because teachers are taking our class at the University of Hawaii. And in 2017, Hawaii State Teachers Association put this out on their Facebook. Today, the National Education Association's Representative Assembly meeting in Boston approved new business item number 37, that the NEA will publish an article that documents the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893, the prolonged illegal occupation of the United States in the Hawaiian kingdom, and the harmful effects that this occupation has had on the Hawaiian people and resources of the land. And this prompted these articles to be published by the National Education Association, the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government, the US occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, and the impact of the US occupation on the Hawaiian people, where I direct attention to denationalization that occurred since, as far as a formal policy, 1906. Also, it prompted United Nations independent expert, Alfred, Dr. Alfred Desaius, who wrote a letter to three judges in the state of Hawaii. He stated as a professor of international law, the former secretary of the UN Human Rights Committee, co-author of the book, the United Nations Human Rights Committee Case Law, and currently serving as the United Nations independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order. Now, his commission as an expert came from the UN Human Rights Council. He further states, I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity, but a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States, resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions require that governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. In April 17, on April 17, 2019, the Royal Commission of Inquiry was formed by the Council of Regency. The purpose of the Royal Commission of Inquiry shall be to investigate the consequences of the United States belligerent occupation, including with regard to international law, humanitarian law and human rights, and the allegations of war crimes committed in that context. <laughs> the geographical scope and time span of the investigation will be sufficiently broad and be determined by the head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. Article three that established the commission states that the composition of the Royal Commission shall be decided by the head and shall be comprised of recognized experts in various fields. Now, Professor Federico, Lin Federico Lanzarini is the deputy head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry, and I currently serve as the head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. The first task of the Royal Commission of Inquiry was to publish an ebook at no charge on the formation of the Royal Commission of Inquiry and on certain subjects relating to the Hawaiian Kingdom and its prolonged occupation by the United States. And here's that book that is uh, downloadable. Okay, Just type in Royal Commission of Inquiry Investigating War Crimes and it should take you to that link. 
and it uh, has a, a section here, an introduction on the, the Royal Commission of Inquiry that I wrote. Also, Chapter 1, I'm the author regarding Hawaiian constitutional governance, governance and also Chapter 2, the United States Belligerent Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Chapter 3 is authored by Professor Matthew Craven, University of London, on the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state under international law. Chapter 4 was author is authored by Professor William Shabas, War Crimes Related to the United States Belligerent Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And Chapter 5 is authored by Professor Federico Lanzarini, International Human Rights Law and Self-Determination of Peoples Related to the United States Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. The Royal Commission of Inquiry will officially begin with providing preliminary reports on certain subjects in order to bring awareness as to the scope of its investigative authority and the methods of its investigations. It came up with uh, initially a preliminary report on the material elements of war crimes and ascertaining the mens rea. A preliminary report then followed on the authority of the Council of Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom, followed by a preliminary report on the legal status of land titles throughout the realm, a supplemental report on title insurance, and a preliminary report on the explicit recognition of the Hawaiian state and the Council of Regency as its government by the United States of America. This awareness also triggered the National Lawyers Guild, okay, uh, which is an organization of American lawyers across the United States to send a letter on November 10, 2020 to Governor Ige. It says here that the National Lawyers Guild, the oldest and largest progressive bar association in the United States, with 70 chapters and more than 6,000 members calls upon the state of Hawaii and its county governments as the proxy of the United States, which is an effective control of Hawaiian territory to immediately comply with international humanitarian law while the United States continues its prolonged and illegal occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom since 1893. It concludes, we urge you, Governor Ige, to proclaim the transformation of the state of Hawaii and its counties into an occupying government pursuant to the Council of Regency's proclamation of June 3rd, 2019, in order to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom. This would include carrying into effect the Council of Regency's proclamation of October 10th, 2014, that bring the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom in the 19th century up to date. We further urge you and other officials of the state of Hawaii and its counties to familiarize your yourselves with the contents of the recent ebook published by the Royal Commission of Inquiry and its reports that comprehensively explains the current situation of the Hawaiian Islands and the impact that international humanitarian and human rights law have on the state of Hawaii and its inhabitants. This has also triggered a move, a step to be taken by the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, which last year passed a resolution calling upon the United States to immediately comply with international humanitarian law in its prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian Islands, the Hawaiian Kingdom. The International Association of Democratic Lawyers is a non-governmental organization of human rights lawyers founded in 1946 with member associations throughout the world and with consultative status in the United Nations Economic and Social Committee. IADL is dedicated to upholding international law and promoting, promoting the tenets of the UN Charter in furtherance of peace and justice. In its resolution, it further stated, for the restoration of international law and the tenets of the UN Charter, the IEDL calls upon the United States to immediately comply with international humanitarian law and the law of occupation in its prolonged and illegal occupation of the Hawaiian Islands. That the IEDL fully supports the National Lawyers Guild's November 10, 2020 letter to State of Hawaii Governor David Ige, urging him to proclaim the transformation of the State of Hawaii and its counties into an occupying government pursuant to the Council of Regency's proclamation of June 3rd, 2019 in order to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom. This would include carrying into effect the Council of Regency's proclamation of October 10, 2014, that bring the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom in the 19th century up to date. Now, this information and education and exposure also prompted the Association of Hawaiian Evangelical Churches, made up of Native Hawaiian churches within the United Church of Christ, that uh, originated from the kingdom era, such as Kaumakapili, Kauai Ha'u. Okay? And the Hawaiian Evangelical Association of uh, Churches uh, passed the resolution encouraging to end 128 years of war between the United States of America and the Hawaiian kingdom 
and it passed the resolution. It passed as a resolution at the General Synod of the United Church of Christ, uh, uh, its assembly, its annual assembly this past in actually this month, earlier this month. Now the United Church of Christ is comprised of 800,000 parishioners who are in support of this resolution. Very important because people, private people are seeing this, not just organizations. Also in January of 2018, an application was submitted to the executive board of the International Olympic Committee in Lausanne, Switzerland by the Hawaiian Kingdom National Olympic Committee and it was comprised of surfers okay, within this organization. So the Hawaiian Surfing Federation was formed and this was a picture of the second meeting of the Hawaiian Surfing Federation. So the Hawaiian Surfing Federation is headed by its president, Brian Keolana and Surf Club, Hawaiian Surf Club is headed by Reynolds Hayes and Jason Sibata, who are coaches for Volcom and Billabong. These are reputable people within the surfing professional uh, environment, uh, that entity. And uh, it is currently, uh, its application is in a holding pattern. And Professor Lanzarini is actually the attorney that is representing this National Olympic Committee, the Hawaiian Kingdom National Olympic Committee in Switzerland before the International Olympic Committee. And this also prompted a story, a recent article published by NBC News just after Carissa Moore, who is also a member of the Hawaiian Surf Club, who won the gold. And that's what prompted this article by NBC, Team Hawaiian Kingdom, activists want some US Olympians to surf for a different homeland. It's a really good article, really good article. And finally, a complaint was filed with the United States District Court for the District of Hawaii for declaratory and injunctive relief. Hawaiian Kingdom versus Joe Biden, the United States, but also including 32 countries. At the core is for the court to issue a declaratory relief to enjoin or to prevent defendants from implementing or enforcing all laws of the, of the defendant United States of America and the state of Hawaii and its counties to include the United States Constitution, the state of Hawaii Constitution, federal and state of Hawaii statutes, county ordinances, common law, case law, administrative law, and the maintenance of defendant United States of America's military installations across the territory of the Hawaiian kingdom to include its territorial sea. In this complaint, 32 foreign consulates, foreign countries are also named as defendants because the maintenance of their consulates in Hawaii constitutes what international law refers to as an internationally wrongful act. And once a country is apprised that they are committing an internationally wrongful act against another state, they shall immediately cease in that internationally wrongful act and to provide assurances that that act would not occur again. As a result of this complaint, a letter was submitted to the federal court by the Czech Republic announcing that the consulate had been closed since June 3rd, 2021. And on July 30th, just yesterday, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and the National Lawyers Guild entered the federal case by filing an amicus brief in support of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So what we have there is a, is a historical narrative of what has taken place from the beginning so people can understand the origin of what is happening now because what is happening now has a direct nexus to those initial steps that we took back in 1995. And, and, and I wanted to present that and give it that, that, that historical aspect right, to everyone here. And it's being made of a record because now this is where Federico will be coming in and drawing upon some of those historical events and providing a legal analysis of what I, of some of the events that I had presented. So with that, I'll uh, pass it back over to Kali. Your mute, mute button. <laughs> Okay, now I'm on. <laughs> Bob, Mahalo, Keanu, really appreciated all of that background. 
uh, for those of you who are um, tuning in and watching this program, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, text it. Uh, you need to go to Ahakanaka Moko Okeawe and you can text your questions uh, to us so that we can pass that on to either Dr. Sai or our next speaker that's going to be coming up, um, Federico Lenzarini. But this this is really important so that we get all of you who are who have questions to encourage you to go ahead and text us those questions so that we can ask the ask the experts since we're able to uh, have them all together at once today. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Sai, I I think we're we're gonna uh, so far there's no questions coming up. And so what we'll do is uh, we'll just move on to the next speaker. And if you can put you on hold, because what, what's going to happen is that after uh, Dr. Lenzarini has completed his presentation, then we're going to have a town hall panel type of uh, program where people have been selected and throughout the community to ask questions. And they'll be able to ask questions as well as the questions that you text to us. We'll be able to ask questions of both Dr. Sai and uh, Dr. Lenzarini. So with that, uh, mahalo keanu, really appreciate it. It was awesome. Um, but before, before I do, what I'd like to do is just add more information in regards to lahu iho i e a. And this is a speech that was made by Dr. G.P. Judd at the celebration uh, on July 31st, 1865. This was about 20 years after the celebration was uh, declared by Commandant III. And it says 20 years ago, Kauwe Keole emerged from the grounds of Kanaina. He and Kekona O, Paki, Yoniana, Kanoa, Kivini, and some foreigners on horseback, and they rode to uh, Kalau Kahua. Admiral Thomas was there with his troops and mounted guns in all his grandeur. And also, there were young chiefs and a crowd of natives and foreigners awaiting the arrival of the king. When he arrived, Admiral Thomas came to him holding the Hawaiian flag in his hands. The king and all his people dismounted, and the admiral came and opened the flag to the wind, and then gave it to Kauikeole, gave it to Kauikeole's flag bearer. Right then, 21 mounted guns fired as a salute to the flag, and the British flag was lowered in Pua Hawaiina while the Hawaiian flag was drawn up again, whereupon 21 guns of Pua Waina sounded. Then the British flag was pulled down at the fort and the Hawaiian flag was raised. So the fort fired 21 gun salute, followed by 21 guns from the ship of Karras Fort, 21 from the du Dublin, 21 more from the Hazard, and then the American flagship Constellation fired a 21 gun salute. When that was over, the 21 mounted guns fired a salute in honor of the king. The British soldiers stood in a circle saluting the king and when that was done, the king returned to the palace at three o'clock. His soldiers and the crowd of people all went to the church of Kwaiha'u and gave thanks to God for his grace in restoring the sovereignty of the nation. At three o'clock, the king went aboard the ship Dublin to, din to a dinner hosted by Admiral by the Admiral Thomas. And when the carriage fought, saw the king's flag on the launches, a 21 gun salute was fired, followed by 21 guns from the Hazard, then the Dublin, and then a final 21 gun salute from the Constellation. When the dinner on board of the ship was finished, the king and his retinue, retinue <laughs> came ashore and the Dublin fired a salute. 
followed by the carrots fourth, then the hazard and constellation, 21 guns each. The next day, the great feast of Luakaha was held for the Admiral and Kawi Keole decided that the 31st of July would become a holiday for the nation and the people. What was the reason for this great festivity? What was the reason for the resounding 315 guns startling the mountains and rolling the seas? It was because a flag, once pulled down, had been raised again. I should perhaps recount the source of the entanglement. It was a desire of British foreigners here ashore from Britain to take the island chain. It would not then remain independent. So Consul Charlton sought to petition the Admiral, whereupon the Admiral ordered Lord George Paulette to sail here to Hawaii and do everything according to the terms of the council, and he intended to take the land by war. But the king gave in advance the sovereignty of the land to two of them so as to escape battle. In the manner of a mortgage until such time as the British government could decide about the entanglements that the foreigners had made. The Admiral perhaps recognized his own entanglement because of the transfer to George Paulette under council, therefore was concerned and restored the sovereignty of the nation. Therefore the chiefs and the common people are joyful on this day because of the victory of righteousness over wrong. Just some background on Laho Iho Iea, more information so that we know why we're celebrating these this holiday, as well as the holiday that's coming up on November 28th, and that will be the, the our Independence Day celebration. So let me introduce my next guest, and my next guest is Dr. Federico Lenzarini. He is a professor and extraordinaire in international law, and he is an awesome expert you know, on international law, uh, Juris Doctor from University of Siena in 1998, and he got his PhD on international law uh, in April 2003. He's a professor of public international law, European uh, Union law, International Law of Human Rights and Culture, and professor at uh, Tulane Siena Summer School on International Law and the Arts. And his list can, goes long and long and long. It's a big, huge list of not only the positions that he's had, but all of, all of the uh, uh, books and articles that he has published, and also his uh, membership or representation of different organizations and entities internationally. And so I'm very, very glad that uh, Dr. Federico Lenzarini accepted our invite to be a guest here today because I really want to learn from him, you know, about international law. So Dr. Federico Lenzarini, mahalo for joining us and you're going to have to unmute your your microphone. There we go. Mahalo. And mahalo for joining us. Welcome. Welcome. Aloha. <laughs> mahalo. Kale uh, is indeed my honor and my pleasure to to be here tonight. I hope that uh, the connection works well for the, the entire length of my presentation. And Again, I sincerely wish to thank you and all the organizers of this event for involving me because it's a big occasion for me and a big pleasure as well. Uh, of course, uh, as everybody, I'm sure I have appreciated the presentation by Keanu. Uh, my presentation will be more technical because uh, it it will go into more details concerning certain legal aspects, including certain aspects that Keanu has already mentioned, in order to, to show how the uh, claim of the Hawaiian kingdom to, to recover 
its own identity as a subject of international law and its own sovereignty and independence is well grounded. Again, mahalo and aloha to everybody. I will share my screen now uh, with my presentation. Okay. Okay, so my first point is about the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state as a, and as a subject of international law, which is, of course, the main prerequisite uh, at the basis of all claims of the Hawaiian Kingdom, as Keanu has described in his presentation. Uh, the, the legal basis, in order to ascertain whether or not this continuity actually exists, is of course to be found in the relevant practice of international law. And I would like to start from uh, a very famous arbitration uh, dating back to 1928, the island of Palmas arbitration. Uh, the judge was Judge Huber, which is a very famous name in international law. And the outcome of this arbitration was that occupation of a territory by a foreign state cannot be considered lawful if it is not in line with the current rules of international law governing occupation itself, irrespective of whether or not it might be considered legitimate at the time when the territory concerned was occupied. It follows that belligerent occupation does not affect the continuity of the state. The governmental authorities may be driven into exile or silenced, and the exercise of the powers of the state thereby affected. But it is settled that the powers themselves continue to exist. What is important is that uh, the arbitration that I was referring to uh, is now quite dated, but the same principle has been substantially confirmed by the International Court of Justice, which, as you know, is probably the most important and the most authoritative court in international law. Uh, in a very recent decision uh, released on, in February of 2019, which is the advisory opinion on legal consequences of the separation of the Chagos Archipelago from Mauritius in 1965. The fact that the International Court of Justice has confirmed the principle expressed in the island of Palmas arbitration demonstrates that international law has not changed in all these decades. So, uh, this was just to show what is the legal basis of the discussion that we are going to deepen right now. The main question is whether the Hawaiian Kingdom can be considered today in light of the historical vicissitudes which have characterized the Hawaiian Islands since 1893, a state under international law. And in order to provide an answer for this question, we need to give an answer to two sub-questions. The first is whether the Hawaiian Kingdom was a state at the time when it was militarily occupied by the United States in January 1893. And the second question is, that, is whether in the event that the answer to the first questions would be positive, whether the continuous occupation of Hawaii by the United States from 1893 to present times has led the Hawaiian Kingdom to be extinguished as an independent state and consequently as a subject of international law. Of course, you already have the answers to these questions because they have been anticipated by Keanu. But as I previously said, I will try to go into more legal details in order to show the legal basis of our conclusions. 
so uh, we have now to ascertain whether the Hawaiian Kingdom was a state at the time when, when it was military occupied by the United States of America on the 17th of January of 1893. And I go back to uh, the Larson versus Hawaiian Kingdom case before the arbitral tribunal established by the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which has been already described by, the, by Keanu, um, in the context of which it was declared that in the 19th century, the Hawaiian Kingdom existed as an independent state recognized as such by the United States of America, the United Kingdom and various other states including by exchanges of diplomatic or consular representatives and the conclusion of treaties. It is also important to clarify uh, uh, devoting attention to the basic principles of international law in this field that at the time of the American occupation, the Hawaiian kingdom fully satisfied the four elements of statehood, which were prescribed by customary international law. And this element of statehood were later codified by the Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States in 1933. This is also an old convention, but we have to say that uh, it is still the main parameter of reference uh, for international scholars when it comes to this particular issue. And these four elements of statehood are the first, a permanent population, the second, a defined territory, the third, a government, and the fourth, the capacity to enter into relations with the other states. And all these elements were fully satisfied by the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, other Further evidence of what I wish to prove is that the Hawaiian Kingdom had become a full member of the Universal Postal Union on the 1st of January of 1882. It maintained more than 100 legations and consulates throughout the world and entered into extensive diplomatic and treaty relations with other states, including uh, Austria-Hungary, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Spain, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, and the United States. So uh, we now come to our first conclusion. It is unquestionable that in the 1890s, the Hawaiian Kingdom was an independent state and consequently a subject of international law. This presupposed that its territorial sovereignty and internal affairs could not be legitimately violated or interfered with by other states. Now, the second sub-question, uh, with respect to which I, I, I will now try to provide an answer, is whether the continuous occupation of Hawaii by the United States from 1893 to present times has led the Hawaiian Kingdom to be extinguished as an independent state and consequently as a subject of international law. Uh, I have to admit that in contemporary international doctrine, this issue is certainly controversial and may be considered according to different perspectives. And I say this thing because you can read some articles by other scholars and you can see that these scholars come to different conclusions or I would say to partially different conclusions. But, uh, of course, I will try to show you that there is sufficient evidence to come to a very pre precise conclusion, which is the fact, as Keanu already anticipated, that the Hawaiian Kingdom has not been extinguished as an independent state and as a subject of international law uh, 
uh, in consequence of the occupation by the United States from 1893 to present. As noted by the arbitral tribunal established by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Larson case, in principle, the question in point should be addressed by means of a careful assessment carried out to have in regard, among other things, the lapse of time since the annexation by the United States, subsequent political, constitutional, and international developments, and relevant changes in international law since the 1890s. Having said that, we can first say that uh, the main argument that we can use, and it is an argument which appears to overcome all the others, all the other possible arguments which can be raised as regards the issue in discussion, is that the long lasting and well established rule of international law exists according to which military occupation irrespective of the length of its duration, cannot produce the effect of extinguishing the sovereignty and statehood of the occupied state. And what is most important is that the validity of this rule has not been affected by whatever changes occurred in international law since the 1890s. Uh, here I have, in this slide, I have included another excerpt from another very famous arbitration dating back to 1925, is the Affaire de la Dette Publique Ottomane, uh, solved by the Swiss arbitrator Eugene Borel. And according to the conclusion drawn in this arbitration, the effects of the occupation of a territory by the occupying power before the reestablishment of peace cannot legally determine the transfer of sovereignty. The occupation by a belligerent power of a territory is a simple fact, is a, a state of thing uh, which is essentially provisional which cannot legally replace the authority of the uh, occupied state. Uh, the same position was also uh, confirmed more recently by the US military tri tribunal at Nuremberg in 1948. In belligerent occupation, the occupying power does not hold enemy territory by virtue of any legal right. On the contrary, it merely exercises a precarious and temporary actual control. Occupation does not affect sovereignty. It is true that De facto, which means in factual terms, the displaced sovereignty loses possession materially of the occupied territory, but it retains the title de jure, which means it retains the legal title of sovereignty over the territory. And as I have anticipated, the length of the occupation does not influence in any manner the previous conclusion, because the occupation has an inherent temporary nature. So it can be quite long, it can be very long, it can last for centuries, as is happening in the case of the Hawaiian Kingdom, but irrespective of its length, it cannot determine the transfer of sovereignty. As anticipated by the Keanu, the only form, or I would say the typical form in which a cession of sovereignty can be effected is a treaty. Is an agreement embodied in, embodied in a treaty between the two state concerns. This is uh, 
a statement taken from uh, the work of Lasse Oppenheim, which is one of the most important uh, scholars in international law of all times. And uh, in order to be as more complete as possible, I would add that exceptionally, transfer, transfer of sovereignty might be possible by prescription in the sense that occupation may determine the transfer of sovereignty, but on the condition, and this is an indispensable condition, that there is a question by the occupied authorities and the occupied people. And it is a fact, another indisputable fact, that the Hawaiian Kingdom has never agreed to the occupation by the US. So has never agreed to the transfer of sovereignty to the government of the United States. And the fact that transfer of sovereignty may only occur according to the previously set conditions is a universally recognized rule. So uh, it is a rule of international law, which is, uh, has crystallized in the context of the international community and cannot be seriously challenged. As you know, and as Keanu uh, explained very well, the United States took possession of the territory of Hawaii uh, only through de facto occupation, which is a factual occupation and unilateral annexation without concluding any treaty with the Hawaiian kingdom and without any acquiescence by the Hawaiian people. So uh, this is a first argument which alone could be already decisive to conclude that uh, the Hawaiian kingdom has not extinguished as an independent state. But there are further arguments under international law giving more strength to our conclusion. Uh, one or the main of these additional arguments is that the annexation by the United States has taken place in contravention of the rule of estoppel by virtue of which in international law, legitimate expectations of state induced by the conduct of another state are protected. And in particular, I'm referring to the fact that on the 18th of December of 1893, uh, the US President Cleveland concluded with Queen Lili Okulani a treaty by executive agreement which obligated the president to restore the queen as the executive monarch. And the queen in exchange had to grant clemency to the, to the insurgents. Such a treaty was never put into effect by the United States, but according to the rule of the estoppel, uh, precluded the government of the United States from claiming to have acquired the Hawaiian territory because the treaty had clearly induced in the Hawaiian kingdom the legitimate expectation that the sovereignty of the queen would have been restated, an expectation which was frustrated through the annexation. So, the conclusion is that, according to a plain and correct interpretation of the relevant legal rules, the relevant rules of international law, the Hawaiian Kingdom cannot be considered, uh, even if subjected to a very long occupation by the United States, as distinguished as an independent state and a subject of international law. In fact, in the event of an illegal annexation, the legal existence of states is preserved from extinction since illegal occupation cannot of itself terminate statehood. Uh, and we can go back again to the Larson case that you, at this point you know very well, 
because the possession of the attribute of statehood by the Hawaiian kingdom was substantially confirmed by the permanent court of arbitration, or better said, by the arbitral tribunal established by the permanent court of arbitration, uh, in confirming the position of the court itself that the Hawaiian kingdom was a state. Because as Keanu explained very well, in order for an arbitration to fall within the competence of the permanent court of arbitration, it is necessary that at least one of the parties of the controversy is a state. In the Larsen case, uh, it was a dispute between a state and a private entity, as Keanu has explained very well. And while La uh, Lance Paul Larsen was considered a private entity, the Hawaiian Kingdom was officially qualified as a state by the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And so this confirms the possession of at the attribute of statehood by the Hawaiian Kingdom in very recent times. So we have reached the conclusion according to which the Hawaiian Kingdom cannot be considered as having been extinguished as a state as a result of the American occupation. And this conclusion allows to confirm in a very simple way, without any further uh, legal explanation, that the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state has been under an, an interrupted belligerent occupation by the United States of America from January 1893 up to present. And uh, there is another argument that we should take into account, uh, which apparently uh, could appear to contest in some way the conclusion that we have just drawn. Uh, and it is the argument that the American occupation of Hawaii uh, has not substantially involved the use of military force and did not encounter and has not encounter, encountered in the following years military resistance by the Hawaiian Kingdom. And so since there was and there has not been throughout the whole occupation the use of armed force, uh, according to, uh, to, to, to this opinion, the occupation by the United States could not be considered as belligerent. In reality, a territory is considered occupied when it is placed under the authority of the hostile army, the authority of another government, irrespective of the modalities used by this government to occupy the territory. So the law on occupation applies to all cases of partial or total occupation, even when such an occupation uh, does not encounter any armed resistance. In this respect, the essential ingredient for the applicability of the law of occupation is the actual control exercised by the occupying forces. And this is consistent with the all, all the applicable rules of international humanitarian law. In particular, we may mention Article 42 of the regulations and next to the Hague Convention Fourth, respecting the laws and customs of war on land of 1907 which affirms that the territory is considered occupied when it is actually placed under the authority of the hostile army. And this is the only condition. And more recently, we have the Geneva Conventions of 1949, which remained the, the, the most important authority in the field. And in particular, Article 2, common to the four Geneva Conventions of 1949. So, it is a provision of transversal character, which informs all the rules of international humanitarian law as codified by the Geneva Convention of 1949. This Article 2 establishes that all the four Geneva Conventions apply to all cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of a state party, 
even if the said occupation meets with no armed resistance. So you already know the conclusion. Today, the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to be an independent state under international law. And the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state has been under uninterrupted belligerent occupation by the United States from 70 January of 1893 up to present. The next argument that I would like to uh, present is in particular the one concerning the legitimacy of the establishment of the Council of Regency and the powers of the Council of Regency itself. Uh, also, this argument has already been touched by uh, Keanu in his presentation, but I hope that I will be able to give you uh, mm, more detailed legal arguments concerning this issue. So, is the restoration of a government by a regency legitimate under international law? Uh, etymologically speaking, a regency is the man or body of men entrusted with the vicarious government of a kingdom during the minority absence, insanity, or other disability of the king. Uh, it appears that taking into account the present situation of uh, the Hawaiian kingdom, a regency is exactly the right body entitled to provisionally exercise the powers of the Hawaiian executive monarch in the absence of the, uh, of the latter. An absence which unfortunately continues today forcibly uh, in light of the persistent situation of military occupation to which the Hawaiian territory is subjected. Uh, as Keanu already anticipated, in legal terms, the legitimacy of the Hawaiian Council of Regency is grounded on Articles 32 and 33 of the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution of 1864. In particular, according to Article 32, uh, whenever upon the decease of the reigning sovereign, the heir shall be less than 18 years of age, the royal power shall be exercised by region council of regency as hereinafter provided. Of course, this is not exactly the case of the Hawaiian Kingdom Council of Regency, but this provision already shows that when there is uh, the absence of the legitimate sovereign, then it is possible to establish uh, a council of regency. Article 33 is more pertinent to the present situation of the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian kingdom. Uh, it affirms that it shall be lawful for the king at any time when he may be about to absent himself for the kingdom to appoint a regent or council of regency who shall administer the government in his name. And likewise, the king may, by his last will and testament, appoint a regent or council of regency to administer the government during the minority of any heir to the throne. Then the provision continues with uh, other uh, specific rules. But what is important for us is that uh, when the king or the queen, so the sovereign, the legitimate sovereign, is absent for whatever reason, it is possible to establish a council of regency. And uh, as Keanu uh, specified, of course, in, in this particular case, the doctrine of necessity has been applied. In fact, the council of regency was established by proclamation on the 28th of February, 1997. Uh, by virtue of the offices made vacant in the cabinet council on the basis of the doctrine of necessity. And the application of this doctrine was justified by the absence of a monarch. It follows that the Council of Regency, under the constitutional law of the Hawaiian Kingdom, 
actually possesses the authority to temporarily exercise the, ro the royal powers of the Hawaiian kingdom itself. Now, the Council of Regency is composed by de facto officers and is actually serving as the provisional government of the Hawaiian kingdom. Should the American military occupation come to an end, the Council of Regency shall immediately convene the Legislative Assembly, which shall proceed to choose by ballot the Regent of Council of Regency, who shall administer the government in the name of the King and exercise all the powers which are constitutionally vested in the King until it shall not be possible to nominate a monarch uh, pursuant to Article 33 of the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution of 1864. It follows that the Regency actually has the authority to represent the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state a state which has been under a belligerent occupation by the United States since 1893. And this power to represent the Hawaiian kingdom exists both at the domestic and international level. Even though the Hawaiian kingdom is subjected to a foreign occupation, but as we have seen, it continues to exist as an independent state and the Council of Regency has been established consistently with the constitutional law of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Now, coming to the uh, specific powers which may be exercised by the Council of Regency, uh, we have seen that it has the constitutional authority to temporarily exercise the royal powers of the Hawaiian kingdom. And as a consequence, it has the authority to represent the Hawaiian kingdom pending uh, the American occupation as a state up to the moment when it shall be possible to convene the legislative assembly in accordance with article 33 of the constitution of 1864. And so, the Council of Regency is exactly in the same position of a government, of a state under military occupation. For this reason, it is vested with the rights and powers recognized to governments of occupied states according to international humanitarian law. We should say, in principle, that the state rights and powers would be quite limited for the reason that the governmental authority uh, of a government of a state under military occupation has been de facto replaced by the power of the occupying uh, government of the occupying state. However, at the same time, the occupied government, and so in our case, the Council of Regency, which has, we have seen may legitimately uh, exercise the, uh, the powers of the king of the Hawaiian kingdom. So uh, the Council of Regency retains the function and the duties uh, to the extent possible of preserving order, protecting the rights and prerogatives of local people, and continue to promote the relations between the Hawaiian people and foreign countries. In particular, in light of its position, the Council of Regency may, uh, although to a certain extent, interact with the exercise of the authority by the occupying power. So we understand that in a situation like the one characterized in the Hawaiian Kingdom today, uh, there should be a sort of sharing of powers between the occupied government, which is represented legitimately by the Council of Regency and the occupying force. This is 
a consequence of the fact that the occupant is under an international obligation to take all the measures in his power to restore and ensure as far as possible public order and safety while respecting unless absolutely prevented the laws in force in the country so it is not possible for the occupying power to replace all the existing laws only those laws which are absolutely inconsistent with the situation of occupation existing in the country can be replaced but the others must be uh, taken into force and must be respected by the occupying power which also has to work for a sure respect of those laws by the population under its own control uh, the reason of that is that the main one of the main purposes of the law of belligerent occupation is to protect the sovereign rights of the legitimate government of the occupied territory because as we have seen the sovereignty of the occupied government is only suspended is not put to to an end so the prerogatives of the legitimate government of the country which is the occupied government must be must be maintained by the occupying power uh, and even though the uh, occupying power claims that he has annexed annexed all or part of the occupied territory this is not important uh, in light of international humanitarian law because we have seen that without a treaty uh, the transfer of sovereignty cannot take place. No? So the consequence is that even though there is a claim that the territory has been annexed by the occupying power, the situation remains the same. And the occupying government has an obligation under international law to preserve the sovereign rights of the legitimate government. As a consequence, since the host government, and in our case, the Council of Regency, because as I have said already many times, the Council of Regency uh, legitimately represents the Hawaiian Kingdom and may exercise the royal powers vested in the Hawaiian Kingdom itself, uh, the, the Council of Regency has the possibility to the extent possible to influence life in the territory of the uh, Hawaiian kingdom, even to the point of undermining the occupant's authority. And one way to accomplish such goals is to legislate for the occupied population. Uh, so what I'm saying is that the Council of Regency has even the competence to adopt new laws uh, to the benefit, of course, to, of the population of the Hawaiian Kingdom. In fact, occupation law does not require, as I previously said, an exclusive exercise of authority by the occupying power. On the contrary, it allows for the authority to be shared by the two powers and eh? the occupying power and the occupied government, provided that, of course, the occupying power continues to bear the ultimate and overall responsibility for the occupied territory. But uh, the last thing that I have said that does not imply that, as I have explained, uh, there is no role for the entity which legitimately represents the occupied government. It follows that under international humanitarian law, the acts proclaimed by the Council of Regency are not divested of effects as regards the civilian population of the Hawaiian territory, of the Hawaiian islands. On the contrary, they might, they might even if the concrete circumstances of the case so allowed, apply retroact retroactively uh, 
at the end of the occupation on the condition that the legislative acts concern do not disregard the rights and expectations of the occupied population, which means that the only condition for the validity of the uh, legal rules adopted by the Council of Regency, and even for the possible retroactive application of these rules at the end of the occupation, the only condition for this is that these rules do not undermine the rights and interests of the civilian population. So basically, the only obstacle to the exercise of the authority by the Council of Regency would be that the rules adopted by the Council of Regency would go against the interest of the population of the Hawaiian Islands. Which is not the case, of course. And this is confirmed by the mandate of the Royal Commission of Enquiry, which was established by the Council of Regency by proclamation on April 17, 17 of 2019. And the Royal Commission of Enquiry was established in, in a way which is very similar to the United States proposal of establishing a Commission of Enquiry after the First World War to consider generally the relative culpability of the authors of the war and also the question of their culpability as to the violations of the laws and customs of war committing during the war. So basically, the establishment of the, Count of the Royal Commission of Enquiry uh, should be easily accepted by the United States itself because it has been done in a way that is consistent with the international practice of the United States itself. And uh, it is important now to ascertain what is the mandate of the Royal Commission of Enquiry, because uh, it is the uh, decisive consideration to be developed in order to ascertain whether the establishment of the Royal Commission of Enquiry by the Council of Regency can be considered legitimate under international humanitarian law. Uh, basically, uh, reconnecting this aspect to the previous one. Uh, the main purpose of the Council of Regency has explained by Keanu, so I do not need to spend many words on this aspect, is exactly to, 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 to make the interest of the local population. And one precise way that the, the, the Council of Regency is using in order to realize the interest of the local population is exactly the establishment of the Royal Commission of Enquiry. This is clear from the uh, proclamation establishing the commission because its purpose, according to the proclamation itself, shall be to investigate the consequences of the United States belligerent occupation including with regard to international law, humanitarian law, and human rights, and the allegations of war crimes committed in that context. The geographical scope and time span of the investigation will be sufficiently broad and be determined by the head of the Royal Commission. Basically, the competence of the Royal Commission of Enquiry is to ascertain whether violation of human rights and international humanitarian law have been committed to the prejudice of the Hawaiian population in consequence of the military occupation by the United States. So it is evident that what the Royal Commission of Enquiry uh, wants to do is exactly to realize the interest of the local population because uh, of course, the, the fact of ascertaining whether violation of human rights and international humanitarian law uh, is an essential prerequisite to reinstate justice and eventually to provide the Hawaiian people with all the rights of which they have been deprived. So basically, the Royal Commission of Enquiry has the purpose of trying to 
at least clarify, but uh, eventually even uh, to find a remedy for the uh, most important violations of the rights of the civilian population. As a consequence, and we go back to the previous point, from the proclamation of the Council of Regency, it is evident, establishing the Royal Commission of Enquiry, it is evident that uh, the, the, the Commission does in a way undermine the rights and interests of the civilian population. On the contrary, its purpose is exactly to protect such rights and interests. For the reason that the Commission, through establishing whether violation of human rights and or international humanitarian law have been committed during the occupation by the United States, would establish the factual basis for the victims, so for the Hawaiian people, to obtain justice, even through access to reparations, which is, of course, the ultimate purpose of access to justice. In other words, the proclamation of the Council of Regency establishing the Royal Commission of Enquiry pursues the clear purpose of ensuring the protection of the Hawaiian territory and the people residing in the territory against the wrong effects which may have resulted from the occupation uh, to which the Hawaiian territory is actually subjected uh, also in, in, in our days, also today. Consistently with what I, I, I said a few minutes ago uh, with regard to the possibility for the Council of Regency to exercise even a legal function, the proclamation establishing the Royal Commission of Enquiry represents a legislative act aimed at furthering the interest of the civilian population through ensuring the correct administration of their rights and of the land. As a consequence, the proclamation establishing the, the Royal Commission of Enquiry has the nature of an act that is equivalent in its rationale and purpose to a piece of legislation concerning matters of personal status of the local population. And it is exactly the kind of legislation which requires the occupant, the occupying power to give effect to it. The proclamation does in a way affect the rights and powers of the occupying power. And this is important because we have seen that even though in a situation of military occupation like the one characterizing the Hawaiian kingdom, uh, there should be a sharing of the exercise of powers between the two governments, the hosted one and the occupying one, uh, the last word is of the occupying power. So uh, any action, any legislative act uh, adopted by the hosted government must not affect the rights and powers of the occupying power. And in this case, the proclamation of the Royal Commission of Enquiry uh, for sure does not affect the rights and powers of the, uh, of the occupying power, which is the United States, because under international humanitarian law, is it, it is beyond any doubts that the occupying power is bound to guarantee and protect the human rights of the local population, as well as international humanitarian law. As defined by the relevant international treaties of which the occupying power is a party, as and by customary international law. This is important because even though the United States has not ratified some of the relevant treaties in the field of human rights or international humanitarian law, uh, the situation does not substantially change for the reason that there are the, the most important principles of human rights law and international humanitarian law correspond to rules of customary international law, which by their very nature are binding for all states in the world. 
irrespective of the treaties these states, uh, those states have ratified and so have accepted. Uh, basically, the proclamation has the purpose of giving realization to the human rights of the civilian population of the Hawaiian territory. And this is actually one of the purposes which should be pursued also by the occupying power. So the proclamation certainly does not undermine or significantly interfere with the exercise of uh, the authority of the occupying power and is consistent with existing international obligations. So the conclusion is that it is totally lawful and consistent with international law. The occupying power, as a result of the foregoing, cannot be considered absolutely prevented from recognizing the legitimacy and eventually from applying the proclamation of the Council of Regency establishing the Royal Commission of Inquiry as a piece of domestic legislation protecting the human rights of the local population. So the occupant has a duty to do that, to recognize the legitimacy of the proclamation and to apply uh, the, the rules adopted also by the Royal Commission of Inquiry. I have already anticipated my conclusion, which is, I mean, in my opinion, it is not possible to seriously challenge this conclusion, is that the establishment of the Royal Commission of Inquiry is actually to be considered fully legitimate under international humanitarian law. My last point, of course, this is just uh, my view and does in a way um, anticipate the conclusions of the work of the, uh, of the Commission of Enquiry even though uh, I am the deputy head of the Commission of Inquiry, but this is just my personal view, okay? But let us see what is very briefly the legal basis of the possible existence of violations of human rights and international humanitarian law arising from the US occupation of Hawaii. First of all, in international law, we know that the law of belligerent occupation has developed as a specific section of the laws of war. Military occupation is indeed a belligerent situation, even as we have seen, when no military force uh, has been used or is longer used. The law of occupation governs the relationship between the occupying power on the one hand, and the uh, occupied territory and its inhabitants, including refugees and stateless persons. Uh, it is important that um, the law of occupation governs not only the relation, the, 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 I mean, the affairs of the citizens of the occupied country, but also those of whatever person who resides at whatever title in the territory of the occupied state. Uh, its main element, the main element characterizing the law of occupation is the actual control exercised by the occupying forces. Uh, I was mentioning uh, the legal basis. First of all, we have the main relevant conventional instruments particularly the four Geneva Convention of 1949 and the two protocols of 1977, which have added new rules to those included in the Geneva Convention. And then we have customer international humanitarian law, which is particularly important because as I previously said, uh, they are binding for all states in the world, irrespective of whether or not they have ratified the relevant treaties. Uh, sorry. Please excuse me. First, 
The civilian population of an occupied territory cannot be forced to fight its own country, be involved in any way with the armed forces, or give military assistance to the occupied to the occupying power. Second. The occupying power must at all times guarantee respect and protection of civilians in their person, honor, family rights, religious convictions and practices, private property and manners and customs. Third, private property is protected. Fourth, seizure of property is only possible in limited situations and according to very strict rules. Any discrimination for reasons of race, nationality, language, religious convictions and practices, political opinions, social origin, or position or similar consideration is unlawful. Also, individual or mass forcible transfers and deportations of the civilian population for the occupied territory are prohibited. The occupying power must not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. Since the legitimate state authority has passed into the hands of the occupying power, the latter must take all measures in its power to restore and ensure, as far as possible, law and order and public safety. In principle, the occupying power should allow the territory to be administered as before. I have already insisted on this particular point. It must respect the laws in force in the territory before occupation, unless it is absolutely prevented from doing so. Certain central administrative functions must be allowed to continue uninterrupted in the interest of the population. The occupying power must ensure the proper functioning of the courts of law and administration of justice. Military courts may be established, but they must comply with the rule of law and ensure that the accused receives a fair trial. A fair trial. Also, civilian resources and services may be the object of requisition in occupied territory only in accordance with strict rules. This may only happen when the resources or services concerned are needed by the armed forces of occupation or for public utility services, or to feed, shelter, clothe, transport, or care for the population of the occupied country. And then only if they are indispensable for these purposes. And finally, the occupying power has the duty to ensure that the population is provided with supplies essential for the basic needs and the survival of the civilian population in the occupied territory to the fullest extent that it can. I'm not saying that all these rules have necessarily been violated during the occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, but certainly we can easily see that some of them have been, have been the object of infringement. As it comes to human rights, the only thing that I would like to emphasize is that originally international human rights law was conceived for application, was conceived exactly for application in peacetime. So uh, there was a clear separation between human rights law on the one hand and international humanitarian law on, on the other in the sense that why human rights are applicable uh, in, in this time. In the event of an armed conflict, including belligerent occupation, only international humanitarian law would be applicable. But then most recent practice has totally changed these dynamics. For the reason that of course, human rights provide better protection for the individual person than international humanitarian law. So uh, current practice, which has been confirmed by the International Court of Justice, by all the, the most important human rights monitoring bodies at both the UN and regional levels, and is 
commonly shared by scholars is that human rights are full, fully applicable in time of war. And at the same time, in situations of belligerent occupation. And this fact is beyond question. The only exception is that according to certain human rights treaties, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which the United States is a party, uh, some of the human rights established by the treaty can be suspended in time of public emergency. And an armed conflict can be considered as a public emergency. So also a situation of belligerent occupation. But the most important human rights, those of absolute character, cannot be the object of any derogation or sus suspension, even in time of public emergency. It follows that according to international law, uh, when there is a military occupation, whether lawful or unlawful, state responsibility is engaged when there is a violation of human rights in a territory over which the occupying power has an effective control. Also important is the concept of the continuing violation of human rights. A continuing violation comes into existence when an act resulting in a violation of human rights committed in the past continues to produce wrongful effects after some or even a long time, irrespective of when the primary, the primary material fact, act of omission from which such effects started to be produced took place. Uh, the concept of continuing violation of human rights may apply in situations of belligerent occupation. Let us think, for example, at the situation of unlawful deprivation of property. Even though property was unlawfully taken to the legitimate, legitimate owner uh, 100 years ago, it is possible that the effects of this deprivation continue to exist today because the legitimate owner or uh, his or her heirs continue to be without the property of that particular thing. So there is a continuing violation, even though materially the violation took place in a far past. And when there is a continuing violation of human rights, uh, the occupant state is responsible for the violations committed in the past, even when when those violations were committed, were not considered uh, a breach of international law. This is important because if the effects of a violation continue today, the, the occupying state can be responsible of those violations uh, because uh, the, the effects have an implication of the life of people today, even in the event that they were not considered wrong at the time that uh, when they were committed. In the case of Hawaii, the relevant human rights rules which apply are those included in the treaties to which the United States is a party, particularly the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as those proclaimed by customary international law. We know that the United States has not ratified many uh, human rights treaties. But I repeat for the third time that no state can escape the rules of customary international law because they're binding for all countries in the world. And it is to be clarified that the United States has never declared so far the existence of a situation of public emergency in a way, which in theory would just justify the suspension of the enjoyment of human rights consistent with the relevant international rules. Okay, so uh, the argument of the existence of a state of emergency cannot be used because such a state has never been declared. We may conclude that there is a legal basis for the Commission of Inquiry to investigate the violations of international humanitarian law and human rights. And it is very likely, and I cannot say more at the moment, of course, that the, conclusion of, the conclusions of the Commission will find the existence of several of those violations. Uh, I conclude my presentation here um, 
I also had the intention to describe some very important uh, recent developments, including the, the, the action of the Hawaiian Kingdom against the United States, including the application to the International Olympic Committee. But I think that these arguments have been already satisfactorily covered by Kean, so I'm, I don't have anything uh, important to add. So I thank you for your attention. I hope that my presentation was not too boring. And again, I thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity. Mahalo, Federico, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we're gonna uh, uh, bring in our panel for um, for questions. It's our, we're calling it town hall panel, you know, for discussion and questions, as well as taking the questions that you submitted uh, to us via uh, text messaging. But as we're bringing people in, I'd like to also let you know that Ahakanaka um, Moko Keaume has got uh, t-shirts and some hats that we have for sale like this. And we also have some, some t-shirts. There we go. That's a picture of one of the hats that we have for sale that you can go to our um, our website or contact us and we'll let you know uh, what it is. And and these Deoccupy Hawaii t-shirts that lets people know uh, that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. And I tell you, it's very, very effective. <laughs> Every time I wear the t-shirt in public, uh, somebody always comes up to me and makes a comment and it's never a negative comment. It's always been a positive comment, but we have these t-shirts available, you know, uh, for sale and the monies that we make will help to fund our conferences as well as uh, other things that, uh, that we're doing for the Lahui. So, if you're interested in, in ordering one of the t-shirts or two or, or all of the t-shirts and buy it for the family or better yet, buy it as Christmas gifts, you know, so that you can uh, give that to your Ohana and family. That would be great, you know, if, if you do that. So again, this is our, our, uh, our, our way of raising money so that we can uh, try to keep bringing these kinds of programs to all of you and educational programs to uh, make sure that the Lahui knows the truth and they know what, what is really happening. So uh, it's very, it's, ex it's exciting. And at the same time, uh, let's get the word out that the Hawaiian Kingdom is illegally occupied, wear the t-shirt. And I have a couple of friends from Utah that probably wear it, you know, wherever they go. They, uh, when they come back to Hawaii or even if, uh, as they're walking around, you know, up in America, those t-shirts are being worn. And I've seen t-shirts uh, in other places that just surprised the heck out of me when I saw it. So uh, get your, uh, illegally occupied t-shirt from from Ahakanaka Moko Oke obviously. Okay, so if you haven't already, start to put together your questions or, or send your questions in. I have uh, two or three questions that people have asked on uh, that they sent a text to me and so forth. So I'm gonna be pro providing that for 
Dr. Sai and uh, Dr. Lazzarini. This question comes from uh, Candy Polomio. And she asks a question is that, I understand the Council of Regency is acting as the Hawaiian government in a legal representation sense. It is my understanding that there are no administrative functions at this time. As American citizens, protected persons under international law who have settled in Hawaii, how can we proceed forward with the restoration of the kingdom government full and whole so that we may become naturalized as a Hawaiian kingdom subject? Let me get that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so naturalization under Hawaiian kingdom law is identified in the civil system. So uh, a, a foreigner, meaning a non-Hawaiian subject, right, must at first reside within the Hawaiian kingdom for five years. And that's what gives him or her that capacity to apply, not it's a guarantee naturalization will be granted. So under Hawaiian law, the Minister of the Interior, with the consent of the monarch, it's right, specifically stated in the, in the in the civil code, can grant naturalization to somebody who applies. Okay. Now, as far as the Council of Regency and, and our position as serving as an acting government, right, uh, we do have administrative responsibilities. There is the, the, the idea of naturalization or the process of naturalization actually falls under my office. I am also the acting minister of the interior. But it needs the approval of a monarch. Now, that can only happen when the occupation comes to an end where the Regency will convene the Legislative Assembly who will elect by ballot a Regency or Councilor Regency, uh, whether or not confirming or replacing us or electing a monarch, like how Lunalilo was elected or Kalakaua was elected. Okay, That process can only take place when the occupation ends. Now, we are inhibited by what is called the law of occupation. Now, the law of occupation, its purpose is to preserve, not change, preserve the status quo of the occupied state. And that would include its national population, its institutions, right, its laws, also its territory. So with regard to the population of Hawaii, it's not what the population would become under the law of occupation is what was the national population and the alien population before the American invasion on January 16, 1893. So back then, what you had were, you had uh, 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 the population of American citizens, U.S. nationals, out of a population of 89,000 people in Hawaii, they only numbered 1,900. That's less than 2% uh, uh, of the entire population. Now, definitely, that status quo was not maintained. By 1950, the American population, according to the US Census, exploded to 500,000. And that came about as a result of violating, in particular, the law of occupation of transferring nationals from America, US citizens, to Hawaii. So, so the idea of granting citizenship during occupation is not allowed under the law of occupation. That can only take place when the occupation comes to an end and after negotiation, before that occupation comes to an end, which will be envisioned in a treaty, the actions taken by both parties, the occupier and the occupied, will have to try to go back to what was that status quo back in 1893. Now, obviously, we can't go by the exact numbers with the national population or the population in Hawaii, according to the Hawaiian census of 1890. But we can, we can go by the ratio, the percentage with regard to the uh, uh, increase of, of, of the Hawaiian national population, okay? And also the resident alien population identified how many British nationals were here, how many French nationals were here. So all of that goes into negotiation. So we aren't able to provide any naturalization because we are precluded to do such a thing because of the law of occupation. Uh, maybe Federico has something to add? Uh, 
Mm, no, no, I, I think you, you have you have been very, very comprehensive. Kali, you're muted. Kali, you're muted. Um, this next question is for you, Federico Ikelemai. Uh This is in regards to uh, the Czech Republic having uh, closed down the, their uh, consulate temporarily or whatever. Uh, what impact, you know, with this, with what the Czech Republic consulate has done Will it have on the other 32 countries here in Hawaii that you see? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I hope that you that you hear me because my connection is getting yes. quite bad okay. in this moment. Okay. Uh, yes, I have seen this question, which is very interesting indeed. I have not yet. Uh, got in touch with uh, Michele Carbone, but it is my intention to do that. Um, it's it, it, it is not easy to say whether the uh, Italian government uh, will be influenced by the decision of the Czech Republic. Uh, it's quite it's quite difficult to foresee uh, the behavior of the Italian government in this respect because. Uh, generally speaking, my government is used to pay uh, particular attention to the relationship with the United States. So um, they, they think twice because doing anything which even potentially could, uh, could not be a good gesture towards the, the American government. But at the same time, uh, I'm convinced, like Anu, that the, the arguments wrote about in the in the action uh, are quite valid and so uh, I will try to convince the, the 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 Italian government that they should imitate the 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 behavior by the government of the Czech Republic um you know with uh, the closure of the Czech mm -hmm. Republic and uh, are there? What are the penalties, if any, for the uh, consulates that do not close down and follow international law? Uh, should I go, or Keanu, do you prefer to 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 go first? Uh, why don't I start off, and then if I if there's something else that needs to be covered, then we can speak after Federico on this subject. So. So in our complaint uh, that was followed by Dexter, the attorney general, in federal court, it specifically addressed a, uh, a letters that were sent by myself as the acting minister of foreign affairs ad interim, because the previous officer had passed last year, a couple of years ago. But these letters were sent to the embassies of the 32 countries that have consulates in Hawaii. So the embassies in Washington, D.C. Uh, operate through their consulate generals who then also communicate and work to the honorary consuls, right? So in Hawaii, you have both consul consulate generals. They report directly to the embassy and also honorary consulates. They report to the consul general in the United States who then reports to the uh, embassies, their embassies in Washington, D.C. Now, under Hawaiian law, similar to American law, a diplomat who wants to establish consular services within the territory of another country must pre pre present their credentials to the authorities of that country. Okay, And then that country, if satisfied, would then grant what is called an executor. An executor is basically a commission that allows that particular country to establish either a consulate general or an honorary consulate. That's a diplomatic post. Those 32 countries that have their consulates here are also members of the Administrative Council of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which means at least as of 2000, the annual report of 2000 of the Permanent Court of Arbitration 
which they are a member of the administrative council of the permanent court that publishes these reports, they, they would have known that Hawaii was occupied, right? Now, the subsequent annual reports that were then issued annually until 2011, where they identified the past cases, clearly stated that the Larson Tribunal was established pursuant to Article 47 of the 1907 convention that formed the court. And that's the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes. Article 47 allows non-contracting states access to the institution so that can assist the parties in forming a tribunal, an arbitral tribunal, which is what occurred in our situation. So the letter that was sent to these 32 countries by myself in my capacity as the <laughs> Minister of Foreign Affairs ad interim brought it to their attention that their maintenance of these consulates in Hawaii constitutes an internationally wrongful act. Now that comes under what is called the Articles of State Responsibility for Internationally Wrongful Acts, which is considered customary, representing, representation of customary international law. And it just so happens that Professor James Crawford, who served as the president of the tribunal, was in fact the special rapporteur out of the International Law mm -hmm. Commission of the UN that was in charge of finalizing those articles, which he did after the arbitration award was issued uh, in the case of the Larson case. So I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with, with that Articles of State Responsibility. Now, it says that when a state knows that it has committed an internationally wrongful act, they shall immediately cease that internationally wrongful act and stop any other state from continuing to commit that inter internationally wrongful act. Now, what the Czech Republic did was they shut down temporarily their consulate here in Hawaii because of that information that was conveyed to the embassy and also incorporated into the complaint that draws attention to the internationally wrongful act. And the Hawaiian government acknowledges that what the Czech Republic did was in conformity with the Articles of State Responsibility for Internationally Wrongful Acts. And the letter that was sent to the U.S. Uh, uh, District Court Judge, uh, Ron Trader, basically we took it as an assurance that they won't open it again. Now they can reopen it as stated in the letters to the embassies, which included the Czech Republic, by presenting their credentials to the Council of Regency. And then we would have the ability, whether or not, if they're in order, to grant an executor. No different than what the United States would do through the U.S. State Department within its own territory. Now, the other part of the Articles of State Responsibility that still applies is that you may stop an internationally wrongful act, which you are supposed to do when you are faced with that information. But it also provides in the Articles of State Responsibility reparations for committing that internationally wrongful act. Now, that would be subject to negotiations uh, in the near future, right? That has not taken place yet. But what has taken place was the Czech Republic's uh, uh, consulate was shut down as of June 30th, 2021, right? So there is that connection there. Now, our position is that all of the consulates must cease to operate because they all constitute an internationally wrongful act, which would include the Italian government. But again, Federico is not part of the government, right? But it's the government and the responsibility that each government has, whether Italy or not, that has a consulate in Hawaii to conform with customary international law as articulated in the Articles of State Responsibility. So things are moving, but what this does show is how serious the situation is being taken, and that's important. And it's part of phase two of the Council of Regency's uh, uh, strategic plan called exposure, exposure at all levels, because our job here, as very eloquently stated by Federico in his legal opinion and his analysis, the Council of Regency, Regency is here to fix, help fix the problem. And we need a relationship with other countries and in particular, the occupier in our country. And we need to draw attention to them that this is serious. And I can assure you the negotiations have already started 
where one of the main parties who was a defendant that I cannot mention, they're taking it very seriously, very seriously. And that's what's important. So uh, there are things that have happened behind the scenes in, 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 in Hawaiian culture, right? You never say you're going to go fishing, right? You say, I'm going to go holo holo, which means I'm going to travel. Because the belief was, if you tell people <laughs> you're going to go fishing, uh, the fish will hear and you won't have anything. So when the Hawaiian government comes back to the people of Hawaii after fishing, we will show you that here is this type of poke, this, uh, as Hawaiians say, chopped up fish. But that fish may not be from a particular area you thought because you can make poke with many different kinds of fishes. And we have many different countries that are involved here. So things are very serious and, uh, and, and there are things that we can say and we can't say. But again, this is part of exposure and, and education. Uh, Federico, anything you may wanna add? Yeah, um, may I have just a very few words? Can sure. you hear me? I yes. apologize because in this in this moment my connection is not good. So uh, I have lost many uh, of the words said by Keanu. Uh, if I understood correctly, the question was about the the possible penalties, no, for the states yes. Yes. Uh, violating international law. Uh, but I think Keanu has already uh, answered to this question. It's not a matter of penalties. I mean, in, in interstate relationships, the, the issue uh, of penalties is a very complicated one and is also governed by the articles on state responsibility uh, mentioned by Keanu. Uh, the fact is, the important fact is to attract the attention on the international, of the international community on the situation of their way. So the more states are going to, to recognize the illegality of the situation, uh, closing the, the embassies of their consulates, uh, the, the, the more states uh, alternatively will be found responsible of violations of customary international law in this respect, the more the, uh, the condition of the Hawaiian kingdom and that will be improved and the, the, the fight of the Hawaiian kingdom to recover the recognition of its statehood and independence uh, will, will proceed in the right way. So uh, the purpose of involving those countries mentioned by Keanu is not to try to apply penalties to those countries for their violations of international law to maintaining their consulates in the territory of the Hawaiian kingdom, but is rather to increase the attention of the international community and the awareness of the international community that illegal acts, violations of international law are occurring in the Hawaiian territory, which is exactly the, uh, what is necessary for the Hawaiian kingdom to bring about its its fight, its current fight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists. We, we have four pa panelists from uh, different, different areas, uh, a couple of them from Hawaii, and we have one one of the panelists who lives in uh, uh, Nevada. And I'd like to introduce Alex Pea and Jen Ruggles and Manu Kayaba Hello. and Kelly Akina. And so Jen, I'd like to start with you. Your, your question that you have for the panel. Uh, for either Dr. Sai or Dr. Lenzeri. Sure, thank you. Hello, everybody. My first question, which I think a lot of people might be wondering, is many of the defendants are 
honorary consuls. So I was wondering if you could explain what an honorary consul is and what their role is and why they're on the complaint. Uh, who do you directing that toward, Jen? Either, either of you. Uh, well, why don't I take a stab at it just to explain what a consulate is, right? And how it differs from an embassy. Okay, so uh, both embassies and consulates are diplomatic posts, but embassies that are formed in another country are always established at the seat of government of the receiving state and they represent the interests of the government of that country, okay? To include nationals of that country, but more so the government. So there's a direct relationship between a diplomat as an ambassador to the receiving state for direct communication. Now, consulates are not necessarily representative of the government, but rather are representative of the national population of a particular country in the receiving state. So they normally look out for the commercial relations. Yeah? Uh, also under the uh, Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, when a national of a particular country is arrested, uh, the arresting authorities within the receiving state have a duty to contact the consulate of that person for legal advice, right? So the function of the consulates are more toward the nationals of the country, mostly commercial relations, right? And also legal rights within the country itself, as opposed to the embassy, which the embassy represents the government of the sending state to have a direct channel with the government. And normally you would always see embassies established in capitals. Consulates are normally established in cities or places where the nationals of that country uh, reside or do business. Yeah. Now, under the consulate general, which is below the embassy, you have what is called honorary consuls. So honorary consuls can be manned by nationals of the receiving state, but are under the direction and, and, and supervision of consulate generals that would be in another city. Right, so that's the relationship, but but honorary consuls under the consulate general all report to the embassy in the receiving state. And that's what's important. So Federico, maybe you have something else to add to that? Mm. No, not, in reality, the, the only thing which comes to my mind that can be relevant for the Hawaiian Kingdom as well, uh, relates to, to a rule of the European Union. Because when one is a citizen of the European Union, is entitled to the assistance by all embassies and consulates of all member states of the Union. So th this is relevant for the Hawaiian Kingdom as, as well, because many of the countries which have, established, which have their consulates in the territory of the kingdom are uh, uh, belong to, to member states of the European Union. But basically, it was just a curiosity to say that uh, these particular consulates may uh, take care of the interests not only of their own nationals, but also of all nationals belonging to member states of the European Union. Okay, I'd like to introduce um... Mano Kayama, who is an instructor at University of Hawaii, uh, Manoa, and uh, an excellent CPA. Mano. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. That's not usually a problem for me. Aloha mai kako, hao ore la, hoi hoi ea, and mahalo nui for this great forum uh, that you're putting on to help educate our la hui. Uh, yes, I am a professor over at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, but I'm not one of those that um, Keanu Sai has, has had any problems with at all. <laughs> so I want to make that very clear um, before I ask my question. Uh, you gentlemen have done a very good job of elaborating on many things. So some of my questions kind of went out the window. I, I was going to ask the question about um, Italy, 
Um, and, and maybe if we have time, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and expand on that. But one of the first things I wanted to ask about was um, thank you for the extensive reviewing of the violations of human rights and international human, humanitarian law. Um, and I saw, um, especially as a consequence of US occupation, I saw a lot of vocabulary in there um, that talked about uh, the local population, the occupied population, the civilian population, and the preserving of the rights of these people. Um, so I am understanding that this is a law that's written at the time that the occupation takes place, meaning it's it's uh, applied at the time of the illegal occupation. Um, and I see that the remedies and the protections um, seem to, the law is written sort of like from a perspective that the occupation will be a short period of time. I don't know if I'm making that assumption, if that's a correct assumption, but the reason I say that is because I worried after our own prolonged occupation, who will be defined as these local occupied civilian population and who will get these protections about their land and et cetera, et cetera, um, and that it be uh, inaccurately applied to people who are currently living here once the deoccupation occurs. So if you could just sort of expand a little bit on um, that definition of who are these people. Mahalo. Mahalo. Uh, um, again, I had to apologize because my connection is terrible, but I think that I have understood the, the substance of your question uh, is about the, the, the definition of local population right and who, who is entitled to protection of human rights sorry because i did not hear most of of your words but uh, is, is this the question that's it in a nutshell okay uh, well uh, it's a very interesting question um, because refer, I mean, the reference to local population in reality uh, is to be conceived in a, a broader way than the etymological meaning of the term would suggest. Because when it comes to, to human rights, uh, all individuals are entitled to protection irrespective of their nationality or any other consideration. So for local population, we, we should mean everybody who is present in the relevant territory at a given moment. Any person uh, of whatever nationality is entitled to protection. And if there is a violation, the state responsible for the violation uh, is responsible of uh, an infringement of a rule of international law. Uh, I continue to, to, to reply to your question, imagining that I understood it correctly. If, if not, please stop me, okay? Because again, I apologize. Uh, well, specifically, what I'm talking about is now. So at the time of deoccupation, which when it will happen, how will these people be identified? Are they all the people who are living here now? So I was opening that door. Uh, no, after uh, the occupation, uh, the people may be identified as any person who has been victim of human rights violations in the occupied territory during the time of the occupation, provided that, of course, it is possible to establish the existence of a responsibility under international law by the occupying power. Then, of course, in concrete terms, it is not easy to obtain uh, concrete justice because under international law, the existing avenues for reacting to human rights violations are not so developed. So supposing that, as it is the case, 
the the government responsible of the United Nations the, the 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 violation sorry is the government of the United States. I was thinking about the United Nations because the only the main treaty to which we should refer is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of the United Nations. But uh, but of course the United States has not ratified the optional protocol to the covenant. Uh, which recognizes the competence of the Human Rights Committee to receive individual claims for human rights violations. So the only option in case, the only concrete option for those violations is to submit a claim to the domestic court of the country by the person who have been affected by the violation itself and hope that they obtain justice and redress from the domestic courts. Uh, at the international level, the situation in this respect is quite heterogeneous because for instance, in Europe, we have a regional court of human rights. And so for whatever violation of human rights occurring in a territory of all European countries with the only exception of Belarus, it is possible to submit a claim directly by the victim to the European Court of Human Rights and the, the European Court of Human Rights may release a judgment obliging the responsible state to pay compensation to the victim. But this is not applicable to uh, the United States because the United States has not ratified the American Convention on Human Rights, which has established a similar system, but the system has not been accepted by the United States. And under the, the treaties of the United Nations, uh, the, 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 the possibility to obtain justice is not so advanced because first, the monitoring bodies established by those treaties do not have any binding power over states parties. And second, they only have the possibility to receive individual claims if the respondent state has previously accepted the competence of the monitoring body to receive this claim. And the United States has not done that with respect to whatever treaty. Of course, the claim cannot be presented to the courts of the Hawaiian Kingdom after the occupation because the Hawaiian Kingdom is not the state responsible of the violation. Uh, the, the, the only other possibility is that other members of the international community make pressure on the United States in order to to uh, establish some kind of redress for the victims of these violations. Under an individual point of view, the situation is not so simple and it's not so easy to obtain whatever kind of justice, unless, I repeat, it is provided by the domestic courts of the, uh, the responsible state. Uh, was there any other aspect that you... Uh, you raise in your question that I did not understand. By any chance, is Keanu want to reply on that? Yeah, if I can um, add to what Federico is, is sharing, which I completely agree. Now, also, this is fully explained in Federico's uh, uh, chapter, chapter five, where he speaks of the evolution of human rights law and also the uh, interplay that it has with international humanitarian law. Now, international humanitarian law is a different regime of law from in human rights law, but there are cross sections, right? They're, they do cross over. So in looking at our situation here, okay, there are issues of human rights and human rights is still developing all over the world with regard to enforcement, okay? But international humanitarian law is set in treaties that the United States has ratified or is considered customary international law. So a human right of a fair trial, right, is actually also considered under international humanitarian law, Article 147, that a protected person shall not be denied a fair and regular trial. So you see some cross sections there, okay? So in our situation, when we're looking at Hawaii, and where we are, we need to understand the broader concept, the broader issue here. And, 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 I, and I think it's timely for me to kind of just cover this and Federico can chime in as well, because it will 
allow us to see where do we go or what do we do for redress, right? Okay. So where are we within the international framework of the laws of war? Okay, so there are two state of affairs within the international community where you are either in a state of peace or a state of war. Now, what transforms the situation from a state of peace where certain rules and international laws apply to a state of war where it may not apply or probably wouldn't apply during a state of war is what triggers the state of war. And that is called an act of hostility from one state against another state. So Queen Lili Okalani and her cabinet, when they signed that conditional surrender as a result of the U.S. military presence, that was a recognition by the Hawaiian government that they are in a state of war with the United States. That is not a state of peace. That's a state of war. Now, when President Cleveland completed his investigation with James Blunt, because the administration back then, including Benjamin Harrison, they did not know that U.S. troops were involved. In fact, they were told by John Stevens that U.S. troops were not involved. That was a bald-faced lie. Well, President Cleveland found out that, yes, it was not true, and that the actions taken with the invasion of Honolulu on January 16, 1893, the president acknowledged that the invasion was an act of war, which led to the overthrow of the Hawaiian government the next day, which he also concluded was another act of war. So the state of war, for international purposes, was triggered on January 16th not the 17th, the 16th. January 17th was the surrender as a result of that act of war, right? Now, what does that mean legally? So you can be at war in a material sense, or you can be at war in the legal sense. And the legal sense is that the competent authorities of countries have to recognize the situation, that factual situation as a state of war. That recognition was fulfilled by the Queen in a surrender and President Cleveland in his acknowledgement, in his message, that the troops that invaded Honolulu on January 16th was an act of war. So both competent parties of both countries recognize a state of war. Okay, so what does international law state, say, state about a state of war? Once that triggered, once that's triggered, there's legal consequences now, legal consequences called belligerent rights. Okay, now we're getting into what is called the rules of war, use in bello. Okay, so the rules of war are this, that the nationals of both countries are automatically enemies of each other. Okay, and this is coming from the United States Supreme Court in the Price cases, in a 19, 1860 case. It also all contracts are void, everything, and that properties of both uh uh, uh, countries and their nationals can be seized within their own territory. Very drastic measures which come under what is called the rules of war, the laws of war. That is what happened on January 17. That's what happened. That's how international law views that. Now, the idea of war was hidden and we're all led to believe that we're part of the United States and here we are today with our contracts. Actually, we're still in a state of war. And these points were made uh, uh, in a pleading at the U.S. District Court regarding Hawaiian Kingdom versus Biden, one of our pleadings. Now, the laws of war okay, include the law of occupation. Now, that's, that's another step in the state of, of affairs. So the laws of occupation are triggered when the occupier is in effective control of territory of the, of, of the country that is at war with. Well, that actually occurred on January 17th, 1893, because the Queen's surrender transferred temporarily that governmental authority to the United States president, right? The problem is the United States did not comply with the law of occupation in its state of war, where they're supposed to establish a military government to administer the laws of the occupied state, which means that occupations are supposed to be temporary, provisional. They're not supposed to last a long time. That's why the status quo of the occupied state, which I spoke to earlier, 
is preserved under the laws of war, preserved, okay? Well, obviously, because the United States did not comply with the law of occupation, which makes us still in a full state of war and its legal consequences, is where we are today. So what the Council of Regency, its purpose is, is to provide pressure through exposure to get the United States and the state of Hawaii to comply with the laws of occupation. We are already in a state of war, and we have been since 1893, to begin to administer the laws of the occupied state so that the contracts can now be valid provisionally based upon the proclamation of the Council of Regency, which Federico was speaking to. It hasn't gotten to that stage yet. We're, we're not even at the stage of the law of occupation. We're still in a state of war, right? So this is where it is important that we need to get to that point. Now, the Hawaiian government takes the position that the Czech Republic took with regard to their consulate as beginning to comply with the law of occupation. That was the first moved by an international by a country to comply. Some people might say it's subtle. No, I say that's profound. They shut down a diplomatic post here, right? What other countries are, are they thinking of? And I receive word that there are some countries that are looking into this issue. In fact, one of the country's government, because you know Hawaii is so small, everybody knows each other. One of the governments in Europe called their honorary council directly to their government in Europe. And he left last week. That means they're taking it seriously. So as Federico says, the issue here is to expose and to show, listen, we are seeking compliance. We're not seeking to punish. We've been punished for over a hundred years. Yes, we know. And reparations will be done, but those have to be done within the framework of how international law is understood in a state of war where we're not at that stage yet of the law of occupation. We're really only in the stage of the full scope of the laws of war. And that can also be used, not only being quite scary, but also it can be used as leverage. Because if these foreign countries who have their consulates in Hawaii, their actions will determine one of two things under international law during a state of war. Are the actions taken by these consulates here, is it an act of belligerency in line with the United States as a belligerent, or would it be an act of neutrality? That way their contracts are protected by their nationals. The move by the Czech Republic to shut down the consulate, we acknowledge in our pleading, that was an act of neutrality. That is how it's supposed to work. And these other countries should also know that. So it's knowing that bigger picture of where we are in how we address. Now, when we get to, as human rights violations occur, as Federico spoke of, when we do return to a state of peace, when the occupation ultimately comes to an end, these cases can still be filed. And it's ongoing. You know, you have cases dealing with the former Yugoslavia that is still be, that was heard after the war ended, the wars ended uh, in, in the Balkans by the European courts, right? So it's really here as far as evidence, it's just making sure that we understand where we are. But as Federico said, there are procedures that need to be complied with. These procedures are important and we don't wanna fight it. We wanna know how do we utilize the infrastructure out there to achieve the protection of rights and people. Federico, you had something to say? Yeah, yes. Um, if you can, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I totally agree with you. And indeed, mo most of the things you have just said were also included in my presentation, no? Right. Uh, especially considering the, the, the religion situation and so on. Um, we have to clarify one important thing. I was referring to the uh, concrete possibility of individual victims to obtain justice. And unfortunately, in this respect, international humanitarian law is even less developed 
then you might rise low. You refer to the cases of the former Yugoslavia, but the situation of the former Yugoslavia was quite particular because a special tribunal was established by the United Nations Security Council. The problem is that at present, at present for the situation of the Hawaii, of the occupation of the Hawaii, there is no international body who has the competence to deal with the violations of international humanitarian law. Because in the, the, the current status of international law, the only court, the only existing court which can provide redress in favor of the victims for the violations of international humanitarian law is the International Criminal Court. But the International Criminal Court has no competence over the Hawaiian territory because the status has not been ratified by the, the United States and of course by the Hawaiian Kingdom as well because the Hawaiian Kingdom has not, uh, has, did not have the possibility to ratify the status of the International Criminal Court. So uh, the problem with the violation in, in terms of individual opportunities to obtain justice, which of course does not militate against anything of what you said, okay? But just to clarify, in terms of individual opportunities of obtaining justice at present, there is no way, there is no international body which has the competence to deal with these violations. And this also applies to the issue of responsibility, of criminal responsibility of the authors of these violations. Because you know that under inter for, for the very serious violations of international humanitarian law, we but there is no court having the competence to prosecute the persons responsible of the violations of international humanitarian law in a way. Then what may happen in the future is a different thing. Is it possible that some that if the Hawaiian Kingdom, uh, the struggle of the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to obtain growing consent by the international community, it is even possible to conclude international agreements providing for redress of the victims of the violations of both human rights and international humanitarian law occurring in the Hawaiian territory during the occupation. But uh, I just wanted to clarify that one thing is the purely legal aspect. Another thing is the concrete possibility of victims to obtain redress in front of an inter uh, whatever body. Also for the violations of international humanitarian law committed in the Hawaiian territory, at the present status of international law, the only possibility is to rely on domestic courts. If I can just uh, add right there, um, uh, Federico, I guess, was not aware that uh, the Consul Regency, I believe it was a few years back, we actually acceded to the Rome Statute and it was uh, provided to the uh, sec Office of the Secretary General at the United Nations. So the International Criminal Court is in receipt of Hawaii's accession to the Rome Statute. Now, that is another process for them to now uh, it, they, we have authorized them to look into Hawaiian territory, right? Not U.S. territory, mm -hmm. but Hawaiian territory for the violations of international humanitarian law. But that is a process that the prosecutor will have to address, right? But we have done that. Yes, that, but... That was done. Yeah. It, no, no, uh, but the problem is that the statute of the International Criminal Court cannot be applied ret retroactively. Right. Only from so uh, no the, exactly the, no exactly because it only the court can. will only have competence from the moment when the ratification when when the treaty enter into force yes the exactly. Concern. exactly and that was identified in the accession uh, the instrument of accession that it acknowledges that in that the international criminal court would not be able to entertain violations of international humanitarian law unless those violations occurred I believe after two thousand and two or 2003 when the Rome statute uh, took effect, right? So mm -hmm. you have violations today that can be taken up. But what is also important about the International Criminal Court, there is a provision in there that countries that ratify contracting states 
who ratified or acceded to the Rome Statute, they are the ones primarily responsible for the prosecution of war crimes by their courts. And that's called complementarity, okay? Jurisdiction, which they could exercise one possibility, universal jurisdiction. So if a war crime was committed outside of the territory of that contracting state by a non-national of that contracting state, uh, they could prosecute within that territory. But again, that perpetrator would have to be in the territory of that country. They can't prosecute from afar. <laughs> they have to come in. So in Switzerland, uh, there are examples of uh, alleged uh, war criminals that have come through and they've been apprehended and prosecuted, right? Who were nationals of another country. I believe Finland also recently has done that uh, regarding alleged war crimes. So, so the so the consular regency, our purpose is to um, protect the rights of our people and to provide redress, right? Redress in how to go about this, but it's very complex at the international level. But what we have to keep in mind is we are a country under occupation, prolonged occupation under the laws of war. And we need to see where we fit in that. We're not a part of the United States. We never were. We're not a colony. You know, we're not indigenous peoples mm -hmm. with rights on a de declaration of indigenous rights. We are people here, but the protection, the protected persons, uh, provision of the law of occupation is only triggered when the law of occupation is complied with. During a state of war, which we're still in, the rules of war says you cannot target civilian population, right? So that's different. That's a little different. So we have to be careful that we have to ensure that we transform the situation into the law of occupation and that is where our purpose was, because that is where you start to move towards solutions. Right now, we're in what is called chaos. What we're trying to do is bring some organization to the chaos through certain rules that lead to certain steps. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to go to our next panelist, uh, Kalau Pea, and he's coming to us from uh, Nevada and What's, what, what's the question that you have for our two guests? Absolutely. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Maika uh, Iloa. First, aloha mai kako and haoli la hoi hoi ea. First, uh, mahalo nui loa to Dr. Kiana Sai for his tireless and profound role in exposing America's occupation over the Hawaiian Islands. And also, mahalo nui loa to Frederico Lanzarini um, for taking your time all the way in Italy to, to address this as well. Um, my first question is directed to Dr. Keanu Sai. Um, what parallels do you feel are applicable for what happened to Hawaii's occupation in 1843 by the British over King Kaui Keohuli and the current um, American occupation that started in 1893 with Queen Lilio Kalani? And then how does the understanding of la hoi hoi ea and what we're up against um, give us hope today? Good question. Um, okay, so I'm going to answer that question within the framework of international law. <laughs> so when Lord Paulette seized Hawaii yeah, in February of 1843, we were not an independent state yet. That would come later in November. So we were not a subject of international law when Lord Paulette took over. Now, what Hawaii was at that time was a British protectorate under the British Empire. In fact, Lord Paulette was justifying his act against the Hawaiian government because we weren't acting British anymore. We were going beyond that, right? And uh, Richard Carlton was a complainant who served as a consulate, a consul here. And he was later replaced by Simpson, right? So the problem there was really a problem within the British Empire. And that's why the means of negotiation and Commandment the third appointing those three individuals before Lord Paulette showed up was to secure recognition of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state 
which eventually happened in 1843 on November 28th. Okay. Now, when we say La Hoi Hoi Ea, what was restored in, on July 31st was not Hawaii sovereignty under international law. It was actually Hawaii's governance because it was Lord Paulette that took it over, said, you guys aren't being British enough. Remember, we have the Union Jack on our flag at that time. We're British by nationality okay, since 1794. So that became more of like an internal uh, dispute within the British realm. And that's why the, the, uh, the diplomats, when they were securing the recognition of Hawaiian independence, they couldn't go directly to the British to recognize Hawaiian independence because the British had already said that there are other powers, Britain and, uh, 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 sorry, uh, France and the United States, and that no one power would have more interest or mm -hmm. control over these islands. So the, the, the diplomats, basically had to use the U.S. against the British, use the British against the French and the French against the British. It, it was, I call politique. They had to play that, right? Because in order to secure ultimately the recognition of Hawaiian independence, the Hawaiian diplomat, Ha'alileo and William Richards actually had to travel to Belgium. <laughs> and when they spoke to King Leopold, King Leopold opened the door for them to speak to the French because King Louis Philippe was King Leopold's brother-in-law. So they, this is what is called diplomacy, right? But what they ultimately achieved on November 28th was that Great Britain and France jointly recognized Hawaiian independence and then followed by the United States in 1844, okay? So now going back to that question of what can we learn from what occurred? Well, our queen, Lilik Wokalani, she knew that story of what happened with Lord Paulette and the protests or yielding of authority pending the outcome of the diplomats done by Kamehameha the third was instructional for the queen at that time and Hawaiian government officials. So that is why she crafted, and they say it was Paul Newman, the former attorney general of the kingdom that put that together, but the queen ultimately signed it with the cabinet ministers that they would yield their authority to the United States, not transfer, pending a condition called investigate. So our kupuna, our, our head of state at that time in 1893, drew upon Hawaiian experience with, a, with another power that informed the actions that would be taken 50 years later in 1893. So what we have in our history is we have events that we can learn from capitalize on the successes and learn from the mistakes. And, and that is what actually happened then. Now, should the British, after 1843, do what Lord Paulette did, okay, now international law kicks in that exists, that would have existed at that particular time. And that would be called, either it was a state of war or a state of peace. And that's when things would be different with the, with the British, but it only would be different after 1843, not before, November 28th. Okay. Mahalo. Uh, next panelist, Kelly Aquino. Hello, Kako. So um, I got a whole bunch of questions, but I'm trying to figure out which one I want to ask. Um, I think that um, just hearing the discussion and the presentations really about you know, um, it's kind of changing my mindset as far as like, well, how do we need to get ready? So as a teacher, um, I have a kind of a two part question. Um, the first one is for both both of you, um, what resources would you recommend Hawaii teachers read in order to understand the current political history? So what kind of things? Because a lot of it is new. A lot of it is um, new information and even it's international information that most local teachers might not have or understand. So maybe like what's the top resources you would recommend them to read? And the second part of the question is, um, what type of content or classes or information do you think our youth need to learn in order to help with the return of our government? Uh, Federico, you wanna start on that? Well, I think you're better qualified as regards the first question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I would recommend, first of all, uh, 
two books uh, to be used. Uh, Uomo, okay, that is uh, the history book, which is stems from my doctoral dissertation, right? And that's more of a historical narrative of what took place with some parts of international law, but I had to really adjust the text to make it more of a historical book, even though that was my doctoral dissertation in political science, international relations and law. So I really kind of left up a lot of that, the legalities out, but more of a narrative, right? Just the basics. But also the other book would be the Royal Commission of Inquiry, which Federico is another author of. Now that takes the legal approach to the historical narrative, right? So I would recommend that would be good, but also in conjunction with UAMA. And there are other articles and publications out there that have been published. I would say that be careful if you read or see anything in these books or articles that refer to Native Hawaiians as indigenous people and colonization, don't use it because that's going to add confusion. But if it does refer to country, if there are books on international law, like this, you might find a book on Amazon called uh, International Law for Dummies. Hey, <laughs> get that. Maybe Amazon has, I don't know if they do, right? But, you know, it, as far as teaching, what, what we need to do is, again, we're not trying to restore the government. So, Kelly, when you said, when, so we can restore the government, the government has already been restored since 1997, which is how we got to where we are. Now, that provisional government that is there called the Council of Regency is why we got to this point to where we are, but it has to operate within the, the strict rules of the law of occupation and how that works in order to ensure compliance. So our job is to ensure compliance to the law of occupation. So if people are gonna be taught in the schools, they need to be taught what is occupation. What what is a state of war? And that's all covered in, in the in the ebook, the Royal Commission of Inquiry. Now, once the occupation eventually comes to an end, and I say not anytime soon, because so much work is gonna have to go into that to deal with the problems that occurred because of the violations of the laws of war and eventually the laws of occupation. Because it has to attempt to go back to what was that status quo in 1893. Right now, the national population of the Hawaiian kingdom is a minority in their own country. That's not how it was in the kingdom in 1893. It needs to go back to that. Now, how do you do that? That's negotiation. So I'll give you an example of occupations and how long they last, the law of occupation within a state of war. So in the case of Germany, Germany was occupied where the law of occupation applied, not the laws of war, the law of occupation began to apply when Germany surrendered in 1945. And that lasted until the Bonn Convention took effect in 1955. So Germany was occupied for 10 years mm -hmm. under the law of occupation, right? Prior to that, it was engaged in full war until 1945. In the case of Japan, when the Japanese authorities signed the surrender to the Allied forces headed, uh, led by uh, General MacArthur on the USS Missouri in Tokyo. Okay? That's when the law of occupation began to apply on Japanese territory. And MacArthur was the military governor who's responsible for administering Japanese law and also implementing the surrender treaty, the provisions of the treaty. Now the treaty of peace entered into with Japan was signed in 1954 in San Francisco, where they finally negotiated everything. And then 1950, 1955 was the last ratification when it took effect. And that's when the Japanese occupation ended. So there's a difference between being belligerently occupied, which we are, as opposed to the occupier complying with the law of occupation during its belligerent occupation. We're not, that at, we're not at that stage yet, which is what prompted the, uh, the, the federal lawsuit to have the court issue a declaration saying that you are enjoined from imposing American law. All of that goes to the laws of occupation that has not been initiated yet, even though we've been under the effective control of a foreign country since January 17th, 1893.
Federico, do you have anything yes. to add? If I may, yes. Uh, about the books, yes, the, the one that I had in mind was the, the, the book of the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, it, it is quite technical, but I think that the, in most of its parts, the narrative is not difficult to follow, even for people who are not expert in the field. So I agree with Keanu that it would be very, uh, it could be very useful. As regards the teaching, uh, allow me to go uh, a little beyond law. Um, <clears throat> uh, honestly, I cannot say when uh, the, the, the occupation will take place. I have to confess that uh, the, the situation is proceeding, in my opinion, even in a very good way, in the sense that I'm quite surprised by the results that has been obtained uh, since the, the days when I uh, join this fight thanks to Keanu. Um, the, 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 I mean, the fight is proceeding in a, in a very good manner. But for me, it is important that uh, children are thought also the, uh, an awareness of the situation that is taking place in the Hawaiian kingdom. And together with knowledge, also the sense of belonging to the Hawaiian people. The need to go back to what happened almost 120 years ago and uh, to, um, to make them aware of the fact that what happened after that date is not the reality of the Hawaiian Islands, is not what should be in the Hawaiian Islands. It is important that um, this awareness is instilled in the people because um, the, the fight will never end in this way, even though it should last for a long time. When the people are convinced that the result to be obtained is that particular one, then there is no danger that the, the activity which can be carried out at a given moment by only a few people uh, will be vanished with the passing of generations. Then, of course, my hope is that we don't need to wait for many generations in order to achieve what we are trying to, to, to obtain. No. But the, the awareness by the people, in my opinion, is always a very important element because everything which is really revolutionary and stable starts from the bottom. And of course, the, the bottom is a very positive word in this moment. So it is important that the activity uh, brought about by Keanu and other people, and modestly, I try to give my contribution as well, but is accompanied by a growing awareness by the Hawaiian people that we are trying to correct a situation which is wrong. Even though uh, the children, of course, were born in this status of thing, and they can think that it is normal to be part of the United States of America. You know, if I can add on that with regard to the children, because it's so important. So Kili, as you are an instructor, a teacher at Kamehameha Schools, uh, you're dealing with students that are, that are Aboriginal Hawaiian, right? But you also have children that are not Aboriginal Hawaiian, but live in Hawaii. And we need to find ways to explain some very complex ideas in a simple way. And I found using metaphors, you know, metaphors that, that us locally can understand. And I did this in my class. I teach a summer session at UH Manoa. So I teach it from 1030 to 1145. Um, and just the other day, this past, this Friday, uh, I think it was thir well, Thursday, we were getting into the now what. What do you do with this information? We're, we're midway through the class, right? It's a six week course, introduction to the Hawaiian kingdom. And I brought up the story of the mo'o. Now, local people, we, we know mo'o is the lizard. That's Hawaiian for lizard, right? Uh, I refer to the lizard in this capacity as the kiha. That was the name of Liloa's father, kiha nui lulumoku, the giant supernatural dragon, right? Now, we all know, and I shared a story with them, 
that I remember I used to play with, with geckos when I was young, yeah. lizards in the, in the yard. And I would notice that the lizard would, the tail would come off, right? And it would start wiggling like this. And then the lizard runs. And I didn't know that it was actually the lizard that breaks his own tail. And you would, and I remember hearing a pop, pop, and the, and the tail goes like this. And then when you're looking at the tail, the more left. The important thing that I learned as a young child, I saw that same lizard and the tail began to grow. <laughs> it grew back, right? All of a sudden, I, I, I realized that that was a defensive mechanism. That was survival. Now, what has happened here was our tail broke. It snapped off. Now, a tail is used in any animal for guidance and balance, right? You ever saw what happens when you cut the tail of a Doberman? It takes, for a, it takes a while for that Doberman to actually start running, but it's all off balance, okay? A tail is what guides it, and that is what the kiha has, the tail. The tail is our history the mo'olelo, and that provides the guidance in moving into the future. Well, back in the, in, in the early 1900s, our ancestors, I say, they deliberately cut the tail and a pop happened, not because America did it. No, we made the decision as, our, as far as our kupuna survival, play American, and that was a deception. Now, up to that point, that tail of this mo'o has not grown. So we've been moving very off balance as a people. Mm. What we need to do is we need to grow that tail back. We need to grow that tail to have confidence. And our young kamali'i, the children throughout Hawaii, need to learn this as Federico was talking about. Grow your tail, let it grow, and encourage that with the students. And start off with the basic premise of national consciousness. Hawaiian national consciousness as a frame of mind. And that is what we call aloha aina, not, not love of the land, aloha aina, as my, co my cousin Kaui can articulate from the newspapers where they drew where that name came from. Very different from uh, malama aina, aloha aina. It was actually drawn from a newspaper translation, Federico, from Italy, about the unification of Italy. And they found the word patriotism in Italy. They had to translate it. And they came up with alohaina, which is patriotism. Eventually, the word patriotism was the name of the organization, Hui Alohaina, from 1893, the Hawaiian Patriotic League. So we need to bring a national awareness of patriotism in the minds of, 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 of the Kamali, the young children. And we need to teach them it's OK to be critical thinkers. It's okay to ask hard questions, but I leave that up to the different teachers at the different levels of, of, of school on what, at what level do you, are you able to share that, right? When does it get too complicated? See, for me, I, I kind of already deal with those in college. Well, Kelly, you deal with those in high school and others deal with those in middle school. And, 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 and that, is applied very differently. So I think that's where the teachers all come into play. So one thing we learn in the army, uh, we would, before we can train the, tr train the soldiers, yeah, because there's certain standards, uh, you have to train the trainers. I took it upon myself knowing that was before I can teach the students, I need to teach the teachers who then teach the students. Okay. So it does happen from the bottom up, but it also, is impacted by the top down, but there needs to be that connection that I think we still need to develop. And I think uh, the university and Manu and what's going on at the University of Hawaii, should have, we should be having workshops on how to develop curriculum at age appropriate levels. And that is another level of not just talking about law like Federico and I, <laughs> that's talking about national consciousness. Okay, speaking of national consciousness, uh, Keanu, I know you have to go catch a plane. And so I, I, I don't want to be the reason why 
you didn't get <laughs> to where you're supposed to go. <laughs> I'll, I'll, and, I'll let Kina know. I'll let Kina know that you made that point, Kali. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, I got to be honest. The reason why I have to fly to Oahu is because my wife and I have to watch my two grandchildren because my son and my daughter-in-law are going out tonight. So hands down, I appreciate it and, and consider this a privilege, but my grandchildren come first. I got to go to Oahu <laughs> to go watch them. <laughs> okay, we, we, we don't want to be a reason why, you don't, why, why you're not there for your grandchildren. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mahalo Keanu for, for joining us. And Federico, I know it's 12 hours. You're 12 hours ahead. It's uh, after midnight. But uh, if you can just stay a few more minutes with us, I know that, you know, our panelists, our, our panelists have got questions for you. And uh, Keanu, mahalo nui and safe travels to you. Okay, Jen. Uh, one question, and we'll go around real quick, and hopefully we can uh, get to all four of you with one question for Federico. Okay. So all of my questions are regarding the recent complaint filed by the Council of Regency um, against Biden and 29 it seems like there's about 29 countries on there for declaratory and injunctive relief. And so I was just thinking it would be good to explain what is declaratory and injunctive relief and what would that look like? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for this question. Uh, I, um, I think this this move to, to submit the, the claim has been very much reflected and the, the, it was considered that it was the right time now because uh, the time has come to try to increase the awareness by the international community and the support for the, the, what the Hawaiian Kingdom and especially the Council of Regency is trying to make right now. Um, if the existence of violations of international humanitarian law in particular, but violations of international law more in general would be recognized by the, the, the court, it would be a very important step towards the recovery of the independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Because um, it would be an explicit recognition of the international responsibility of the United States. Uh, so far, this argument has only been advanced by uh, the, the Council of Regency and the Commission of Enquiry. So it is something which basically comes from the Hawaiian Kingdom. But should it be recognized basically by a court of the United States, then uh, the, the government of the United States would be forced to take this situation into consideration because uh, what the United States is doing right now as regards any kind of step that the Hawaiian Kingdom is trying to achieve is to remain silent and to block any kind of attempt. For instance, uh, it is what is happening as regards the application before the International Olympic Committee. We presented this application in 2018. I tried many, many times to get an answer. Uh, I, I made many telephone calls and I tried to go to Switzerland in person. And all the time they were replying saying that, okay, now we are going to consider your application. Now we are going to consider your application, but the application has never been considered in practice. So basically, the, the approach now is to try to uh, stop everything that the, uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom is trying to, to do at the international level. Uh, this claim is important because, again, if there should be a recognition by a court of the international responsibility of the United States, the situation would totally be different in this respect. 
and uh, it it would also be a recognition that a belligerent occupation exists and that the Hawaiian Kingdom has not been legally annexed, annexed by the United States. And so is not under international law part of the United States. And even though I would say uh, the claim would not be accepted by the court, it is important as well because already some results have been achieved. For instance, the fact that the Czech Republic has decided to close the consulate and other countries are considering to do the same. So this is attracting attention on the situation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So in my opinion, this is the, the main importance of the claim. In importance, which I repeat, exists irrespective of the outcome of the claim uh, of the claim in front of the court then of course if the outcome would be would be positive uh, would be much better of course okay mahalo uh manu can you hear me yes okay aloha um real fast if there is such a thing as a real fast question I'm just wondering how we can, as a community and representatives of the Lahui, uh, maybe persuade other countries to do what really is right and ethical, uh, rather, you know, than what seems to serve them currently uh, because of their fear of reprisal from the United States. I'm just wondering if, um, if you know, Frederico, of a plan for, I mean, you already have kind of had a small admission that you believe um, maybe it's politics, that's why Italy wouldn't uh, step up, but you're not sure, of course. Any plans um, that we could maybe start implementing now? Uh, you mean as common people? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I remember that when I was in the islands, in the it was 2017, and I received a similar question at the at the meeting at the Kamehameha School, and my answer was that first of all, all the people, all the Hawaiian people, have to we need to believe in what. Uh, Keanu and everybody are going to to are doing right now. This is important because each time that you have contacts with people belonging to other countries, for instance, in Hawaii, in in normal situation, of course, now uh, the pandemic has changed the dynamics of uh, the social life. But in normal situation, you have many tourists. And uh, I know that, for instance, in Italy, the people is not aware of the situation of Hawaii. Uh, they don't know that Hawaii was occupied by the United States in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, and that this occupation is illegal. Hawaii simply considered a state of the federation. And uh, this goes along with was what I was saying earlier, that it is important to create an awareness. And of course, first of all, this awareness must be created at the at the national level. Now I'm going to use again the word local, at the local level, which means, I mean, at the level of the Hawaiian Islands. But also an international awareness would be important because in the end, governments are very much influenced by the way of thinking of their people, of the national people. And probably if this awareness would uh, would mature in some countries, it is possible that some organizations are created in order to pursue the rights of the Hawaiian people. And the activity of these organizations may influence the uh, international behavior of the government. So each person, in my opinion, may give a contribution, even though it is a very little contribution, but uh, you know that uh, 
also the big mountains are made up of stones, not of little stones altogether. You know, uh, sometimes I am also scared about the, the possible reactions uh, by the, the, the US government. Uh, now, the, the situation appears more relaxing with the new administration, but especially uh, under the Trump administration. I'm used to travel to the, the United States many times for my teaching and for oh. other reasons. And I was afraid that suddenly uh, an entry to the United States was denied for this activity that I'm carrying out for, for, the, for the Hawaiian Kingdom. But I convinced that when you really believe in somebody, you should not take into consideration the possible side effects. Uh, you have to to bring about your idea, your ideas, and of course, each person can give a contribution depending on the position in which he or she is vested. But every person can contribute to, to this struggle, especially the the, the the Hawaiian citizens in uh, contributing to create this awareness, not only at the national but also at the international level. Well, Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to tell you you're muted. Thank you. Mahalo. 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 Mahalo nui loa. Um, so I guess it's it's a very interesting situation for me um, as I was thinking and pondering of a question um, because I'm I'm one of the Hawaiians that are not in the Hawaiian kingdom. I'm currently residing in America in uh, Reno, Nevada, which is, I, I call it, I nickname Joint Resolution Land. <laughs> so this, uh, and, and the reason why I, I mention this is because half of our, our, our population, um, at least as far as the Kanaka Maoli citizen and subjects of the Hawaiian kingdom are, are um, you know, on, on the American continent. So the reason I ask this question is, is just to inspire those on the American continent to repatriotize and, and to recognize the problem and, and to do something. So this is kind of a pointed question that I, I, I know the answer to, but I've been trying to contact the local legislation of the Democratic Party since Francis Newlands was a Democratic Senator from Nevada, um, particularly Catherine Masto, and um, Jackie Rosen, um, because they they basically held the same democratic status as senators and in the Democratic Party that Francis Newlands had when he wrote the joint resolution to acquire the Hawaiian Islands. So my question to you is more of a question for them. Do you think that democratic senators from the state of Nevada have the power to acquire foreign territories by a joint resolution. And not <laughs> <laughs> mm, not at all in my opinion. I mean <laughs> uh, of course my 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 perspective is that of international law, but and under international law this is not possible. And uh, then I'm not really expert of the the the, the law of Nevada, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in terms of international law, it, it is certainly not possible. Uh, but what you were saying, uh, while you were speaking, I was reflecting. Uh, what you were saying is very interesting because I imagine that the situation of the Hawaiian people living in the, let us say, in the continent is not so easy because at least to what I know personally, uh, the United States is one of the countries in the world in which the sense of belonging to the nation is stronger. Certainly it is stronger than in my country. In my country, most people are used to say that 
uh, we are not a good country we should learn from the other the other places and we we would be happy to go to live abroad and so on on the contrary uh, american people are very proud of belonging to the state so i can imagine that a person uh, an hawaiian person living in the, in the american continent is taken between the the sense of belonging to the hawaiian people but also the influence which comes from the place where this person lives uh, in the sense of being american uh, and in, in this period i have many times tried try to imagine whether um, somebody uh, some politicians in the United States uh, also, of course, belonging to the Democrats, because at least the idea that we, we have in Italy is that the Democrats would be more open to this kind of situation than the Republicans. But of course, I, I may be wrong. Uh, uh, I, I'm trying to imagine whether uh, a Democrat politician could be in favor of uh, saying that, okay, the Hawaiian Kingdom is entitled to independence and we should uh, release the Hawaiian territory from, from our state. Because on the one hand, there can be a sense of justice, no? especially if you consider the history and also the legal aspect that we, we have tried to explain today. On the other hand, there is this sense of belonging to America, which means, oh, I mean, now we are going to lose a piece of our land, piece of our country, and we cannot accept that. So I figure out that this can be one of the, the main obstacles in America in relation to the, uh, the struggle of the Hawaiian kingdom to recover its independence. Even though, I mean, uh, the, the, the American government has issued the formal apology. So basically, in legal term, it has already been recognized that the occupation was wrong and that everything which followed the occupation was wrong as well because it was based on the, on the primary violation, which was the, the, uh, the, the occupation itself. But at the same time, nobody has ever said that the government at level, we should allow the Hawaiian kingdom to recover its independence. The approach, at least to what I perceive, is that, okay, we were wrong and we continue to be wrong, but the Hawaiian islands are part of the United States, and this is the fact. So, uh, under at least in my view, uh, under the American side, I see this as the main problem. I see. Okay. Mahalo, mahalo. Mahalo. Okay, Kelly, Kelly. Kelly has a final question for for this conference, and so Kelly, make it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. One of my eight questions that I didn't get to ask, but um, I know under I, I was reading that one of the violations of international law or laws of occupation is that the occupier. Um, moves their civilian population into the occupied territory. And so um, that's like, I mean, I'm, I live on a big island and we have an influx of Americans coming here uh, since the ending or the, since COVID happened um, to the point where there, there's the, our property values have skyrocketed and it's causing um, locals to actually, people who've lived here for 20, 30, 40 years or generations to leave um, because there's just no property. We can't afford to, spend, to, to pay the taxes. We can't afford to pay, I mean, American people are coming here from the continent in droves and they're paying 20 to 30% above the market asking price and to the point where locals are being driven out. Our nationals are no longer have a homeland to live at. And so, I mean, it, it, since this is a violation of international or the laws of occupation, is there anything that we can do to stop that or to slow that process down? Um, it's just I see that lots of my friends and family are hurting 
to the point where we no longer can afford to live in our own country. Mahalo for the question. It is certainly a violation of the law of occupation, especially if there is the intent to crystallize the occupation through the transfer of the population. No? Uh, of course, it is a formidable way to make the occupation effective. Because if you bring your people on a territory, uh, it, it means that, uh, I mean, that the result would be that uh, the territory uh, will become yours in a way because the people living there, or at least part of the people living there, will feel that the territory belongs to them. So it is certainly a violation. And the problem, uh, in order to, to put this situation to an end, is that the effective control over the islands is in the hands of the American authorities at present. So the only way is to proceed like we are doing right now, uh, step by step uh, with the, the Royal Commission of Enquiry, uh, which is already uh, working in the definition, in, in trying to ascertain what are the violations of human rights and international humanitarian law committed by uh, the US government as a result of the occupation. Uh, trying to obtain more and more international visibility, it is not an easy task, of course, because in order to, to change the, sta the, the, the state of things, it would be necessary to recover the effective control of the territory. So, I mean, materially, how is it possible to to, to stop the, the flow of American people to the Hawaiian territory if you don't have control over the, the, the movement of people in this territory. I have a comment on that, uh, if I may. Um, can, if, if we are actually still in a state of war, I mean, now I'm kind of in a flux, we're occupied and we're in a state of war because we haven't been recognized as being occupied. Um, if we're in a state of war, can we not make them feel uncomfortable for coming? There are a lot of things we can do. Yeah, the, the problem, the problem is that people. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I thought you. No, no, I, I thought you had concluded your question. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, the, the problem is that at present, people are not aware that there is a state of war. So uh, they're not uncomfortable to, to travel to a place where the, there is the state for the reason that they don't know that there is a situation of war, especially because uh, for the reason that no military force has ever been used. So as I was saying earlier, most people think that simply Hawaii is a state of the United States of America and it's not different from traveling there is not different from traveling in any other state of the united states of america on the contrary it's much better because uh, at least for instance in my country many people love hawaii no? because it is considered one of the uh, of the most beautiful places to travel in the world uh, and so for americans as well i mean americans uh, again they, they think that Hawaii is a state of the Federation. And so I don't think they feel uncomfortable to go there. But my point was that would be what we would do. Not that they feel that now, but in our state, we can make people currently feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. With social media, we have a little bit more opportunity to let others know outside the jurisdiction of Hawaii Paiaina, that they're not wanted here. Um, the tourist industry is always very, very uh, up in arms mm -hmm. whenever we do something. And if we were to make the outside world not feel comfortable here and not come and pay and, and do even, even not just 
continental America, but Asian countries coming and investing, we make them feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. about coming here. And it goes out on social media that it's not a place where the Hawaiian people are as welcoming to their paradise as mm -hmm. the dollar industry tries to make. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that that's mm -hmm. something that we can do now. Not that they, they yeah. feel that way now, but we can change their impression of Hawaii. And I also disagree with your comment respectfully about how the military hasn't used any force here because I think the fact that they are here and the fact that they have installations more here in this Paiaina, in this state, than any other state from, from a racial perspective is a force to be contended with. I mean, that to me alone tells us to keep in our place. So um, when you have... Mm -hmm you know, military aircraft flying over your home 10 times a day, you do feel oppressed. You do feel that power. So I, I, I don't know that you actually understand that. I, I see your point. I have to, to tell you what I think. I am now in a place which is very close to a military installation of the United States in my country. And I have airplanes flying over my head all the day. So it is, I am in Italy, but it is a situation very, very similar to the one that you're describing. And of course, I understand your point. Uh, I'm always talking under a legal perspective. And uh, when I, I said that there is no use of military force, I intended under a legal perspective. Then, of course, beyond the legal, the, the legal aspect, uh, the, the the points of view can be different. Uh, of course, I feel oppressed also by, by this situation because with my wife, just today we were noting that these airplanes were flying very, very close to us, and it is dangerous. You know that some years ago. In, uh, in Italy, a, a very serious accident happened on a, a cable way in the mountains, which was cut by uh, an American airplane and many people died because they were just playing and they, they wanted to, 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 to fly uh, under the cable way. And they, they caused this, this accident, which was very serious. Of course, this in some way is a use of military force because they're oppressing local people, but not under a legal point of view. That was my point. As regards your first point, yes, I understand that um, uh, what you, you mean that starting from now, you can make uncomfortable for people coming to Hawaii. But... I don't know whether in the long run this is this would be a, a good step because the Hawaiian Kingdom also needs international support. And I don't think that making the people uh, not comfortable to travel to Hawaii would be a, a good way to obtain international support. Maybe this could be done with the Americans, uh, the, the, the citizens of the United States, and could be a reaction in order exactly to, to try to prevent the situation that the Hawaii, the Hawaiian territory becomes a territory of the United States for the presence of American people therein. Well, I think we, we should reflect on a gesture of this kind because uh, in my opinion, it could be several, I mean, side effects. It probably a... would be better, would be better to, to have the support of the American people. If possible. Okay, good. I, I, I have another question. Um, if the US doesn't come to the table, then what? What happens? And the second question is, what would be another term, because terminology is very important, that we could use, that we should be using, uh, rather than colonization and, occup and or occupation?
Federico? Can yes, you can me? you hear me? Yeah, uh, I, I lost you. your uh, I lost your word. Rather okay. than okay, let let me uh, repeat the question. Question no, is no, no, no. I, I I understood the question, but when you were, you were asking about using a different term rather than rather rather than colonization and or occupation. Um, what would be what is there a better term that we so, should use or uh, let us start from the first if the united states do not come to the table uh, does not come to the table uh, they do not have the intention of coming to the table so this is the reason why international pressure is particularly important it is essential to create a situation in which the US government has no other choice mm. rather than sitting at the table and negotiate with the, the, the authorities of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And I think that uh, we are proceeding into the right way, which is the attempt to obtain international visibility because. What I have seen in my experience is that international visibility and international pressure uh, can do much more than any legal institution. Mm. Okay, so for instance, just to give you an example, when there is a violation of human rights, uh, international pressure also by the civil society is much more effective than a judgment of an international court recognizing the existence of the violation. So this is particularly important. Mm. Uh, as regards the, the terms uh, to which you're referring, uh, colonization is definitely inappropriate because the Hawaiian kingdom is not a colony because colonization implies the loss of sovereignty. Mm. Why the United Kingdom has never lost its sovereignty. Uh, even though, of course, the, the colonization uh, in the 1960s and 1970s has been overcome by, by the principle of self-determination of people, by which of which uh, the colonized people have been able to decolonize and this has been important but I will not use the word colonization for the Hawaiian kingdom because it is not appropriate even though uh, in our writings we advocate the principle of the self-determination of people which is applicable to the Hawaiian kingdom as well but uh, of course, the, the, the scope of the principle of self-determination of people is broader than applying to colonization only because it also applies to occupation. And as regards occupation, I think that uh, it is the right word because occupation implies that there is an illegal situation which cannot bring to a loss of sovereignty. So uh, this word is, in my opinion, appropriate because legally speaking, and again, I'm talking from a legal perspective as usually, legally speaking, the fact of being victim of a military occupation has particular implications, which are the ones that I try to explain in my presentation. The implication that military occupation cannot bring to the transfer of sovereignty. So legally speaking, it is important to, to, to retain this, this term because if we would use another term, then the legal implications could be different. For instance, Keanu, before leaving, was insisting on the fact that the Hawaiian people should not be considered an indigenous people. Because today international law recognizes a number of important rights in favor of indigenous peoples. And so apparently the fact of being considered an indigenous people could be seen 
as positive because you are holder of a number of rights. But when you are considered as an indigenous people, you don't have a right to independence. That is the, way, the, the problem, that is the issue. You have a right to self-determination, which is internal self-determination, meaning that you, you are entitled to a given degree of autonomy within the state, okay? Which is what basically, in a way or another, already happens in the United States, no? Because uh, according to the U.S. Constitution, the state, the, the, the states of the federation have their own autonomy. So this principle would be respected. And the same mutatis mutandis could be applied to the term occupation. The term occupation is important for the implications, the legal implications it brings with itself. On the contrary, colonization is not appropriate. Mahalo. Mahalo, Federico. I'd like to, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to thank you and as well as Keanu for being here in this conference because the information and your uh, your mana'o and thoughts have really, really made it clear. Mahalo, but, but I mean, Keanu is, is the is the main hero of the situation. No? Uh -huh. You can you, you cannot compare me to him in any way. Well, well, you know, you bring to the table, you know, the especially in the work that you've done internationally, you know, the credibility to to what Keanu is doing, and also the value of uh, your international law knowledge is very valuable. No, I have to say that even in the context of my work, uh, it is very easy to find people who do not consider the situation of their wife. Uh, especially in my country, there are many colleagues having a very traditional view of international law, and they don't accept the arguments concerning the right of the Hawaiian people to obtain independence and so on. So it, it is not easy. And especially with Keanu, then this will be my last point because I'm taking much of your time. Uh, when we were trying to establish the, the first commission of inquiry with international experts, we had many problems, many difficulties because we were unable to, to, to find uh, important international scholars because they were all afraid of the possible reactions by the US government. So many people were telling us, um, oh yes, but I have to travel to the US for my work, so I don't want to be involved in this issue because I don't know what may happen. And we received many, many answers of this kind. Mm -hmm. So it is not easy to find people who put the face in the in this situation yes and, and we know that very well because it happened to us here mm. you know when we're looking for uh for attorneys to to represent you know the hawaiian people in, in cases in the courts it was very difficult so uh we're fortunate enough to have um attorney dexter kayama step mm -hmm. up to the plate and and willing yes. to literally sacrifice sacrifice a lot. That's yes, I had the opportunity to know him when I was in Oman. <laughs> well, I, I I hope you come and visit visit us again soon, uh, Federico. You and your wife and uh, your your baby, and let's do this again. <laughs> I would love. I would love. Thank you. Yeah, Mahalo. we would love to have you. Okay. Mahalo, Federico, and, and you take care and uh, stay stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Let's do this again mm -hmm. as more things develop. You too. Okay. Okay. Mahalo. Mahalo. Aloha.
Well, hello everyone for joining us uh, on this conference of La Hoi Hoi Ea, Hau Oli La Hoi Hoi Ea. Uh, I really appreciate you, you being here with us. And also the, I appreciate the panelists that joined us, uh, Jen Ruggles, uh, Manu Kayama, uh, Kili Akina, and Palau Pea, Alex Pea from living in New Nevada. And a big mahalo going out to Lynn Cox. I mean, excellent technical directing on all of this stuff, you know, put together. And a big mahalo going out to Debbie Colangelo and uh, Antonio Valiengo, as well as uh, Keone Kalavi. Um, these are all the people. And of course, my good friend, Bobby Amara. And I hope you're doing well. And I hope to uh, see you back here soon so, so that we can do more stuff. But again, mahalo for joining us, uh, everyone. And uh, we'll be re recorded so that we can replay it uh, for your uh, review and, and your uh, convenience. And please share this information because it is so important. Mahalo nui loa, everyone, and see you at Laku Okoa, November 28th. Oh,